Good evening. I now call to order the Board of Education meeting of Tuesday, October 27, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance along with our student member of the board, Mr. Mahamza. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. And this evening, we will especially remember our former board member, Mr. Roger Hayden, who passed away a year ago. Mr. Mahamza. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Offerman here. Yes, Mr. Offerman. Thank you just for joining us. Just checking in. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. In accordance with uh, our current operations, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public, except for essential personnel, in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting, despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meetings that are open pursuant to the Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, or Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the uh, October 27th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or to consider matters that relate to negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at ecps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is new business personnel matters. And for that, we call on Ms. Lowry. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements, May I have a motion to approve the personnel matter requirements as presented in Exhibit D1? So moved, Matt. Seconded, Kuhn. Thank you. May I have a, is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. 
Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Jones? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Ms. Lowry, the next item? Resignations. Board members, do I have a motion to approve resignations as uh, presented in Exhibit D2? So moved, Matt. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Ms. Lowry? Thank you. The next items are ethics review panel member appointment, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Madam Chair, may we separate the ethics review panel member appointment? Yes. Yes, we can. Um, so may I have board members, may I have a motion to accept the personnel matters as presented in item items D4 and D5. So moved, Matt. Second hand. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Ms. Hans? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. And Ms. Lowry, do you want to present the last item? Yes, it's the Ethics Review Panel member appointment. Is there a discussion, Ms. Hen? No. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. My, I have a motion to accept the personnel matter as exhibited, uh, as presented in Exhibit D3, the Ethics Review Panel member appointment. So, so moved, moved Mac. Kuhn. Second, Mac. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Yes. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is um, item E, administrative appointments. So good evening, everyone, Madam Chair and members of the board. Excuse me, Dr. Williams. Um, no, I'm sorry, go right ahead. So uh, good evening, everyone, Madam Chair and members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointment director in the Office of Special Education. Board members, do I have a motion to accept the item E1, administrative appointment? So moved, Second, Matt. Second, Matt. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll? Dr. 
Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yeah, it's like, could somebody mute? Okay. It's like very loud. Yes, yeah, point of order. Could someone please go on mute? There's a lot of background noise. Thank you for that. Ms. Hen? Can... Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yeah. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Yes, thank you. Our appointed candidate is Jalima Alicia, position director, Office of Special Education. Currently, she is the director of specialized learning in Baltimore City Public Schools. Actually, she has over 11 years of service in Baltimore City Public Schools. Prior to the current position that she's in, she was the coordinator of specialized instruction, a special ed liaison, and an educational specialist. Prior to her experience in Baltimore City Public Schools, she served as a training and technical assistant specialist in the office of the state superintendent of education, Department of Education uh, in the District of Columbia. She also served as the deputy director of special ed and friendship public charter school, a special education coordinator in friendship public charter schools, and a total of five years at Gilmore Elementary as a teacher and as an assistant coordinator, all in special education. Congratulations. And she is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. I usually start that. So welcome. Congratulations and welcome. It's a very important position and we're uh, grateful um, that we have a new member of the team in that role. So the next item on the agenda is the report on policies, item F. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed changes to the following board policy. Policy 8250, board member responsibilities. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibit F and are brought to you as first reader. Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So, who was that? Row. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote to move this to second reader. Dr. Hager? Yes. Yes. Mr. Fester? Yes. Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, the motion carries. The next item on the agenda is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting, and each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board, 
and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute limit and conclude remarks when the time has expired and you hear the tone. The call will be ended and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may always submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. For more information is provided on our board's website at www.bcps.org slash board slash participation. I now will call on our stakeholder groups to speak. And uh, first this evening, we have Ms. Cindy Sexton, uh, president of TABCO. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Like many of you, I am torn and conflicted. I know most students learn best in the physical building and not virtually. I know educators want to be back in schools with their students. I also realize like you, that we are in a pandemic that continues to rage unabated. Like you, I've gotten hundreds of emails, phone calls, social media messages, and more on both sides of this extremely divisive issue. Our educators are working harder than ever to provide rigorous instruction because our two goals during this pandemic are to keep our students learning and to keep our students, educators, and all stakeholders healthy and alive. We recognize that we need small group face-to-face -face instruction and we support negotiating to create a safe environment to do that, but not with the most medically fragile of our students as the first returning group. Unfortunately, the COVID numbers in Baltimore County continue to trend in the wrong direction. This is not the time to bring back the students at the four separate public day schools, not this group at this time. Can we make a plan to bring back other small groups? Yes. And we need to do that by continuing our collaborative work while also negotiating around working conditions. While every topic is not a legal subject of bargaining, working conditions are. We legally cannot leave that out. One ask is that the physical return by educators and support staff be voluntary. Educator retention is a national concern. Having enough qualified substitutes is also a national concern. If the only choices our educators and support staff are given are to return to buildings or take leave, we will only exacerbate these problems by losing potentially hundreds of educators. That is not what is best for our students virtually or otherwise. The plan developed and presented to the four public day schools was shared with them yesterday and yet still has not been negotiated. I know we can come to an agreement where those who want to return to physical buildings can and those who need to remain virtual also can, but we can't do it without the negotiations and the conversations. Pause the reopening while we negotiate. Pause the reopening so our most medically fragile students can remain safe. Pause the reopening and find a way to give educators and support staff the option to remain virtual if needed. Pause the reopening, then let us work together on figuring out what it all looks like. We are ready to do the work. Thank you. And our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Ray Mosley from the NAACP. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Superintendent Dr. Williams. Many years, the Randalls and the Baltimore County branches of the NAACP have been concerned that we are in an educational crisis regarding the achievement gaps in our Baltimore County public schools, particularly our schools in the Northwest area of the county. The Northwest area schools have a long history of underperforming. One of the three tenets of BCPS policy 0100 states, and I quote, raising achievement of all students and closing achievement gaps 
among all students are top priorities of the board, end quote. Although this is a stated goal, the NAACP has seen limited progress in implementing plans, policies, practices, and programs that address closing the achievement gaps. The NAACP commends the board for forming an equity committee this summer with a stated mission to remove structural, cultural, and systemic barriers that lead to diminished opportunity of all BCPS students. One of the first actions of the board's equity committee was to initiate a data-driven equity audit across BCPS, which looked at three areas. First, where are the gaps in our student outcomes? Second, are the identified gaps persistent across years? And third, are the gaps widening? The NAACP believes that this type of data analysis is a critical step in developing solutions to close achievement gaps. The Equity Committee will need strong support from both this board and our superintendent. In a spirit of transparency, the NAACP recommends that the board considers posting the equity audit finding on the BCPS website. The NAACP also commends BCPS for planning to host the fourth annual BCPS HBCU College Fair on November 11th. This event will provide virtual connections to college representatives and instant admission for students. This effort is critically important for our students and their families especially during this COVID-19 pandemic period. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Julie miller breeds from the Gifted and Talented Education Advisory Council. Good, e good evening, good evening. Chairwoman Kazi, uh, board members, Dr. Williams and the BCPS community. The GTTAC had our first meeting of the year on October 7th virtually and found that it substantially increased the number of stakeholders that participated, which is exciting to us. We are always looking for ways to increase the diversity of the GTCAC and having virtual meetings may be one way to achieve this. We are also happy to have had Vice Chair Julie Hendeton. It was great to have her with us. There are a number of issues that have emerged either through our meeting or through emails we have received from CARE. How virtual learning is impacting GT students is clearly one of the areas that is concerning to parents. From emails, online schooling has been rough. I think in particular because the teachers didn't get to start off with the students in person like they did last year. It's been hard for them to assess their individual ability levels in the online classes. In the spring, when they didn't have so much class time and work, we made huge strides with their learning outside of the school curriculum. This year, with so many more requirements, there's no time for anything else. She has to spend so much time learning things she already knows, and there's no flexibility. Or. I watched my fourth grader today in math. He was done in five minutes. Then he Googled Billie Eilish lyrics for the next hour. He reads novels online during class. He doodles. He isn't learning much. Times four kids. Or, meanwhile, my daughter sits in math class, and because of distance learning, she turns her camera off and reads or draws manga during class until it's time to do the show what you know. I sit right next to her for my own work day. I know she's definitely not paying attention in class, barely reads the instructions on assignments, which I think is the cause of the few mistakes she makes and is done in five minutes. Other parents voiced concerns about lost learning opportunities on the asynchronous Wednesdays and wondered if those days could be used more creatively to help engage and enrich students who are capable of moving through the curriculum at a very fast pace. Acceleration for GT students has also raised some issues. Parents are reporting processes that are slow and unclear and that are leaving their children in limbo. 
When students are not getting what they need, they are primed to underachieve in schools. Studies among GT scholars show that underachievement of gifted and talented students has been prevalent and persistent, and that was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. There should be real concern about this. Based on a review of recent research, up to 52% of academically gifted K-12 students become underachievers at some point, and this is especially true for a twice exceptional or 2E students. At our meeting, we learned that data reporting on GT students has begun to be reported to the board. The GTCAC would like to request that the board add these reports to the agenda so that they are discussed and shared publicly. Stakeholders have the right to know what the data is showing about this portion of the student population. Our next meeting will be at 7 p.m. on November 4th, and Dr. Jeannie Painter will be sharing how to advocate for your child's talent development. Hope to see you there. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. That concludes our stakeholder portion, and we are now proceeding to our public comment. Our first speaker for the evening is Dr. Bosch Farone. Good evening and welcome. Our first speaker for the evening is Dr. Bosch Farone. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. I would like to present to you today the, the history of the non-Kumar holidays in, in the school system, because history is important for the future. In about 1995, I asked for equal non-Kumar holidays from Dr. Berger. He promised, but he did not deliver. Dr. Hishton tried his best he appointed me to the calendar committee, and I have been since then a speaker, a public speaker to the board. I would like really to stand today for the courageous and legendary position of Michael Kennedy, who was a board member at that time, and Nicholas Camp, who was a student board member. Both of them in 2004 agreed and supported the principle of equal non coma holidays. In the period from then until a couple of years ago, we had myself and Jamil presented to the board the issue. And I think history is made when Ms. Causey came to the board, Ms. Romaine Williams, whom I'm very appreciative of her efforts, and Mr. Uh, Versch, Steve Versch, all three of them and maybe others has really made the case. In that, in the next board meeting, I would estimate or think that the new calendar would be uh, to discussion and approval. My simple request in there for the Board of Education to be clear that the PD professional days associated with a non-Kumar holiday on the calendar from today forward will not be sacrificed and made a full day because of excessive emergency closures. That would make both the Jewish holidays and the Muslim holidays clearly equal. I always ask the board right up front and coming from the front door for equality and equity. I also highly recommend for the Board of Education to instruct the administration to rely on moonsighting.com for selecting the day of the holiday. I will be more than glad to have any positive input in case administration has any questions. Ada, be quiet. I'm in a meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Diana Bergman. Good evening, everybody. I would like to um, draw everybody's attention 
Good evening, everybody. I would like to draw to everybody's attention oh. our ESOL population of Baltimore County Public Schools. Dr. Williams has expressed that we need to pay attention to this department because as you all are well aware, all our stakeholder groups are properly represented. We have somebody to always speak for our GT students, our special education students, and each of the region. Yet our ESOL population is not properly represented with the voice. In addition, I'm not sure if everyone's aware but currently, due to COVID, the ESO program has been merged once again with our World Language Department. And the state superintendent ended up waiving the test that students must take in order to determine how much service hours of ESO they need. So right now, during our virtual learning experience, I am concerned about our ESO students and if they're accessing the curriculum like any other student in Baltimore County Schools. I don't think that our ESO students are getting a rigorous, frequent intervention approach to access the curriculum to make progress as English as their second language. So I'm asking everybody to please, please pay attention to this program. Please help support adequate virtual access to instruction for our ESO students, especially in elementary. They used to receive a pull-out method of intervention for ESOL services. I have no idea what that looks like virtually, but I know it's nothing close into comparison of what they received before when we were in person. And these children and these parents have every right to access the curriculum, just like any of our students. I did pay attention to the um, curriculum committee when they were talking about our equal opportunity schools. And I would like to see another school added to there. Lansdowne High School made it number 10 as the top schools to be able to access um, for their diversity. And it's a very diverse school, but it's had its challenges too to make progress overall academically. So we need to think about every single student that we have in BCPS and making sure that they're all accessing the most of, they, of what they can for their virtual instruction and their curriculum. So thank you for your time. And I really, really, really hope um, we don't leave our most vulnerable students behind. I know everybody wants to go back in person, but in the meantime, let's do the best that we could for virtual learning for every single child in BCPS. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Allison Stewart. Good evening. My name is Allison Stewart. I'm a parent of two BCPS students. I stand in solidarity with those against virtual learning. I speak on behalf of my son, who is a third grader in general education with multiple disabilities. He also has an IEP, which roughly one in eight Maryland students have as well. He was recently featured along with other students in the Baltimore Sun article titled No Win, which focused on the inadequacies virtual learning presents for students who receive special education services. My child is profoundly physically disabled and requires full physical support to access, let alone be successful in the virtual platform. We have lost our one-to-one -one and IEP supports that are crucial to the progress and development of special needs students. I, as his parent, with no formal training, have been forced to fill the position of his full-time assistant. All of his IEP supports can only be successfully implemented in person. Our school team and admin have gone above and beyond to attempt to mitigate an impossible situation with no positive or clear guidance from the county and state levels. The emotional toll on my child and also his typical peers has been inconceivable. My child is mostly nonverbal, but through tears has pleaded, Mom, please don't make me do this anymore. The frustration brought on by an inappropriate learning environment has been devastating. I have seen pictures and read countless parent accounts of similar and worse, even complete shutdowns in their children. To quote Dr. Salmon, State Superintendent, we understand the number of COVID cases will not be zero. The 
uh, COVID cases will not be zero. For some people, that means the numbers are not acceptable, but zero was never a realistic expectation. This approach disregards the enormous risk to children from keeping buildings closed. I ask the board, if there is clear and certain risk with schools remaining closed, what specific COVID metrics must still be met? When do we stop showcasing the group of students who are successful with virtual learning and acknowledge those groups it is detrimental to and act on such? What about students like mine whose needs have not been considered and these excuses for plans? What about equity? When do we begin surveying non-union non staff about reopening? It is bullying prevention week in our schools, but this board has allowed itself to be bullied and dictated to by bargaining units, the unions, et cetera. When do you, as the decision makers, stand and say no more and begin putting the emotional and educational well-being of our students, teachers, and parents first? I'd like to thank the Reopen BCPS Facebook group for their input and for being an 1800 voice strong joint advocacy for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Over the last few weeks, we have heard the very loud voices of parents of students with special needs asking for, for the schools to open. Why? Some school systems have already opened up with very negative consequences. Just yesterday, Dorchester Public Schools on the Eastern Shore had to shut back down to virtual learning due to significant increase in COVID-19 cases. We know some parents are upset. They feel virtual learning does not and will never address the needs of their special needs children. The concerns on that list are long. Accelerated curriculum, too many hours online, difficulty with connectivity and technology, that list goes on and on. But I can tell you that there are students in the county who are thriving online, students with special needs, and I'm hearing about them. Unfortunately, their voices are not as loud. There is another consequence going on here. The amount of pressure that people are feeling to come back in person when it is not the right time. The numbers are trending in the wrong direction. An analogy that my son said just recently was, don't jump into traffic because the school bus has broken down. That's what we are trying to do. We need to try and fix the virtual learning. Give our students paper textbooks, paper and pencil. Get them offline sometimes. Don't do everything online. That's what's going on right now. Give our teachers the tools that they need to actually teach better in this environment. Virtual learning should never be treated like the regular classroom. Give everyone, our teachers, our students, and other staff members a safe environment to work in. I received a report today from a client whose parent works for the school system who was not told until a week later that somebody in the building where he works tests positive for COVID. That is unacceptable. We need to stay on top of COVID, and we also need to stay on top of and improve the virtual learning. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Hewlett. 
Good evening and welcome. Good evening. I am the president of the Booster Club at Ridge Roxton School. Let me start by saying we want our children to return to the school building. They need the hands-on learning that only comes with being in person. Our students love school. The teachers, staff, and administration are excellent. With that being said, most importantly, we need our children to be safe, safe from each other. Typical protocols will not work in a special needs school like Ridge Ruxton. Most of the children cannot wear a mask, cannot cover their coughs or their sneezes. Most of the students require one-on-one -on -one services for all daily activities. The school has many multiple different disabilities that require close contact with, between teachers and aides with the students, which would make social distancing impossible throughout most of the day. There must be extensive and additional safety and health pro protocols in place to reduce the increased risk involved with these students that can't do their part to reduce the spread of COVID. As parents, teachers, staff, and administration of the students of these special needs schools, it falls upon us to ensure that the necessary precautions are being made to ensure the safety and welfare of these students. Our students all have some kind of medical issues. Each one of the parents face the unique challenge of trying their best to ensure that their child stays healthy and alive, as most of these children have issues that could result in the loss of their lives. Most of these children <clears throat> have been kept at home since the pandemic started. Why, you might ask? I can answer that for you. The parents realize that all the recommended, recommended precautions and safety measures cannot be adhered to by these students, so they keep them home to keep them alive and safe. It is not worth the risk. The formula for this question is individual health concerns plus pan pandemic plus winter plus flu season plus no concrete plan equals potential death for our students. We are asking that the students do not return to the classroom setting until there are systems and protocols planned out and in place and executed to ensure that they, the safe return of Baltimore County's most vulnerable student population. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Tricia Lane Forrester. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Trisha Lane Forster, and I am the art teacher at Ridge Rexton School, where I have taught for seven years. I have taught art for 19 years for BCPS. My son attends a BCPS elementary school, and I am a graduate of BCPS. Since BCPS announced plans to reopen the four separate public day schools first, I have been watching, listening, and asking a lot of questions. I wish BCPS had asked parents first not a robocall, not just a computer survey, really taking the time to call and talk with parents and caregivers to check in and hear their thoughts and concerns about reopening. The four separate public day schools have some similarities and some differences. Ridge Ruxton School currently has 121 students enrolled. Our students pre-K through 12th grade, ages three through 21, are all unique individuals. Some of our students demonstrate the most extreme behaviors. Some have severe medical and intellectual disabilities. Some are the most medically fragile at-risk students in our county's population. As the art teacher, I teach all of our students except for pre-K. My students are some of my favorite people in the whole world. Our students are so important to their families, our staff, our teachers, and to me. They matter. Our students, staff, and teachers should not be used as a test run. Parents and staff received a letter outlining reopening plans to date and in the letter, we were asked to refer to mitigation strategies in the reopening plan, pages 19 through 21, located on bcps.org's main page. Two of the main mitigation strategies are not possible to implement at the four separate public day schools, face coverings and social distancing of six feet. Our administration has informed staff and teachers that our students will not be required to wear face coverings, and they cannot because they cannot for medical reasons and or sensory disorders. Students will be in rooms with other students without face coverings when we reopen, if we reopen. At Ridge Rockson School, we teach academics, social skills, functional life skills, toileting, feeding, hygiene, and self-care. 
When a 3 through 21-year-old student needs to use the bathroom or already has, staff and teachers assist with changing and cleaning. Staff and teachers feed many students with spoons and wipe excess food off of faces. When a child elopes, we catch them in our arms. When a child is in crisis, we hold them in our arms so they cannot injure themselves or others. Social distancing will not be possible. I feel that some BCPS leaders and executives don't understand who we teach, what we teach, or how we teach. When it is safe, I invite you to my art classroom to meet our students, learn their names, watch our dedicated staff work with them as they make art. Members of the board, BCPS leaders and executives, please rescind. Do not put the staff, teachers, and students of the four separate public day schools' lives in peril. Talk to the community. You've had a parking lot full of protesting parents whose children can safely and correctly follow CDC guidelines to prevent COVID-19 transmission. Fix this. We work plans for a safe, sustained reopening based on science. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Christina Powell. Carol. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Uh, yes, Good I can. can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, yes. perfect. Ms. Christina Powell. I'm sorry? Yes, this is Darren Badillo. Hello, can you hear me? Mr. Badillo? Yes, uh, not yet. It's Ms. Christina Powell. Okay. Yes. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Good evening, board members. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I want the schools to reopen when it is safe and sustainable. If you were to open any schools right now, the four special schools would be the worst choice to open. I have been working at Maiden Choice School for 11 years. We work with the students that have physical, cognitive, emotional, social, behavior disabilities, and severely compromised immune systems. Over the last 10 years at Maiden Choice, we have had 30 students die from complications to their disorders and illnesses. This is an average of three students a year. Last year alone, we lost four students before the coronavirus. We know with what is happening in other schools, our students will become sick and God forbid they will pass away. Every year, illnesses like the cold and the flu has come into the building and it takes over. It travels from hallway to hallway in our ancient ventilation systems. Students and staff members get sick in huge numbers. We collect data in the building and our nurses are in constant contact with the health department. Maiden Choice students have been safe at home for the last seven months, and they've been learning. Virtual learning is not ideal, but it is keeping our students alive. Our students are at the highest risk for the coronavirus. They can and will likely die from it. Why would BCPS ask parents to send their students back to a school in person for two days a week into a room uh, with other students who will not be wearing face masks and are not required to wear face masks. The students will be in the four corners of the room working with an adult. They will not be able to interact with their peers like they can virtually. They are able, they are not able to move freely, freely throughout the classrooms, the hallways, and or the playgrounds. Our students need to move. They will be given very limited materials and all of the other materials will be locked away or covered up. This is not a school environment where students can thrive. It is an isolated environment that they will not be able to leave for six and a half hours a day. Our students thrive on routine and do not do well with change. Having our students come to school for two days and being home for five days, changing teachers, being isolated from others, and continuing to have some lessons online is not an effective way to help our students. During those two days, the staff will be dealing with behavior issues and trying to build routines that will need to be retaught weekly. In addition to our students, we need to advocate for our additional adults in the special schools. The additional adults in our schools do similar work to the teachers and parents educators, making a despicable $11 an hour. Our, adult, our additional adults are a vital part of our daily instructions, and we cannot assure the safety of our students without them. Our additional adults need to be provided paid leave and health benefits. I am asking the board to please stop the vote for the return of the four special schools. Our students have been doing an amazing job in rising to the challenges of the online learning. We need to follow the science, not politics. Please stop the reopening of the special schools until it is safe to do so. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Megan Malone. Hi, uh, my name is Megan Malone. Thank you for having me tonight. 
I'm a BCPS graduate and a mother of three elementary school age children. I witness every day how detrimental this platform is to our children's educational, emotional, and total well-being. I stand for the reopening of schools. I could go on for hours about how badly our children are suffering, but this, for the sake of precious time, I direct my comments to you, Dr. Williams. You see, I'm not just here tonight as a mother. I speak before you as a representative of 1,800 fellow Baltimore County parents who are members of a group called Reopen BCPS. We live in different areas of the county. We represent different political views and socioeconomic backgrounds. We have different family dynamics. And the thousands of children we represent all have very different needs from the school system that are not being met. But we all have one thing in common, aside from wanting our children back in a classroom. We are frustrated and appalled over your lack of communication regarding how you are working toward a safe and effective plan to get our kids off of computers and back into classrooms. At the end of the day, the buck stops with you, sir, not with the board, because they need an actual plan from you to vote on, not with the county health commissioner, as you claimed so many times yesterday on the radio, not with the teachers' unions, who you caved to in September after announcing your initial plan to get pre-K, kindergarten, and other high-risk learners back into the buildings next month. You should be providing weekly updates about the health metrics you are using to determine a plan for entry. You should be providing weekly updates about safety protocols that are being considered for students, teachers, and staff when they enter buildings. Most importantly, you should be providing weekly updates about your plan to get our kids back in person as soon as possible. Dr. Williams, we need strong, effective, and communicative leadership from you, and we need it now. As Dr. Salmon shared yesterday, state health metrics continue to remain among the lowest in the nation, and research indicates that school community infection rates continue to stay well below those in the community at large. Our rates are similar to those of Baltimore City, which has recently announced a hybrid plan for reentry. In fact, as of today, 19 Maryland school systems have either opened schools for instruction in some form or at the very least have communicated to students, parents, and staff how and when they intend to do so. Because of silence on your part, this has become an even more difficult and negative situation where parents, teachers, unions, and various other stakeholders have started pointing fingers about where the fault lies in all of this. At the end of the day, our collective priority is the children of Baltimore County. We all deserve a voice. We all need to work together to achieve forward progress. We look to you as our leader. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Darren Padillo. Good evening. My name is Darren Padillo. Good I'm evening. the director of Baltimore Youth Coalition. But most importantly, I'm a father. Virtual learning is not working. My daughter is eight years old and my son is six. My son is in kindergarten. He has an IEP and he was struggling prior to COVID. He had a lot of help with his school and his teachers. But even with that help, before the school year started, with the guidance of the teachers, we decided to hold him back another year in kindergarten as he would be too far behind. When the year started with virtual learning, I had many concerns. But after a few weeks and speaking with some teachers and other schools, parents and some kids, it's not working. My son, as well as other students in kindergarten, are still learning how to read. How are we expecting him and other kids in kindergarten to learn how to operate a computer and virtually learn? Kids with IEPs benefit from peer modeling. My son gets none of that. After speaking with a professional, she said, I think the biggest thing to focus is on social development, especially for younger ones. This is where they learn how to interact, develop, and self-esteem and identity. Something else that was mentioned is that experts often cite that third grade is as decisive year for students in schools. The data shows that children who cannot read by the third grade are four times less likely to graduate than students who can read at that age. And prior to COVID, 83% of low-income students tested below the proficient reading level. 55% of high-income students 
leaving the, leaving the U.S. with a grim overall grip of two-thirds of the children testing below proficient reading. 13% of students consider proficient or advanced. Maryland student reading proficiency scores dropped in 2019 from the national report card. What do you think 2020 is going to be? Let me ask if this makes sense. A kid can go to Dave and & Buster's and Chuck E. Cheese with limited, so, limited social distancing and wear a mask but can't go to school. A child can go to a restaurant with their family, walk to their table with a mask on, take it off, but they cannot go to school. A child can sit at a dealership with their, car to buy, with their parents to buy a car, but they can't sit in a class to learn. A child can walk in the mall, go to stores, go shopping, but can't go to school. A child can play on the playgrounds, jungle gyms, swing, slide down multiple times, but can't go to school to learn. And a teacher can go to restaurants, go to the gym and exercise, buy a car, go to the casino and gamble, go shopping, but they can't be in school teaching our kids. We need to get our kids in school. Let's start now with the children that have challenges, elementary school, middle school, then high school. Virtual learning is not working. And if a kid can go to a Christian school, a kid can go to a public school in Baltimore County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes our public comment portion of the meeting, excuse me, the um, public speaker portion. We now have um, public comment on proposed policies. And so for that, we have uh, two people signed up and Ms. Bergman, you are first. Proposed changes to policy 8250. Hi, my name is Diana Bergman and I wanna share that this policy is it makes me sad. It makes me sad because we had to go to Annapolis to support our student board member to make sure that they equally had the same opportunity as any other hybrid board member on the board to have equal um, access for that amount. You know, the student board member is one of the most important voices in public education. A student board member ends up being a voice for every single child in our school system. A child that tells us and shows us and express to us if they're learning or not. That's the most important voice on that board is the student board member of our public school system. So I'm hoping that this board does more because the student board members should have more voting rights on the board equitably, just like every single voice on that board. That's one. Two, I wanna to bring to your attention as board members regarding this policy, that it only highlights the only thing right now this current board is allowed to get reprimanded on. And that's a, that's, that is if they miss to fail to attend to those board meetings. Otherwise, any other behavior any current board member does right now, we don't have a system on how to hold you accountable to make sure you do what's right for our public school system. But I really, really hope that the student board member has a seat at the table, and not just a seat at a table, but a voice when it comes to public education. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Bash Brown. Good evening to all. Uh, this policy 8250, uh, my concerns about line item 25, excuse me, 23, 24, 25, 26, 28, 29. And basically the policy as I read it, that the responsibilities and duties of board member is to attend a portion of the meetings set, get paid, and if the board member is not coming or not able to come, then that board member would have a good cause to it. That's it. That's what it says that this board and future board's responsibilities are. My comments are not related to this board as much for the future. I believe the policy should reflect that the responsibilities of board members 
to assure safe and effective teaching environments and to assure that they would work towards elimination of any educational disparities based on color, faith, national origin, zip code, etc. And for them to work towards material improvement in the school system. We have 87% graduation rate only. We have only 26 blue ribbon schools. We have to be working harder. I also believe that the board member must have the responsibility to lobby Annapolis and to wa lobby Washington, D.C. for adequate funding for the school system, especially for special education. In that, board members need to clearly have the duty to work towards what is in the best interest of the students, what is fair and without any favors. With that enumeration, I think our schools would be much better. Last but not least, I would like to jot in your mind the possibility that board members need to be paid based on performance. Nothing wrong with it. Everybody needs money. Everybody is putting enough time in it. And I think a board member should not really be paid exactly the same thing whether that board member comes in 75% or 100% or just really sit and not really talk or add to the educational system. This board is the best that I have seen in 25 years, and my comments are not really related to you as board members. I believe this policy should go back to PRC and add some of the items and more than what I mentioned to identify and be clear about what the responsibility is. Thank you. And that does conclude our public comment portion of the meeting. Our next item on the agenda is item H, new business action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on board counsel, Mr. Eric Mercedes. Good evening. Early, earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in its quasi-judicial capacity. That was hearing examiner case number 21-02. The matter was heard on the record because there was no timely request for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action taken in closed session in that matter and to authorize Ms. Gover to sign the order on behalf of the members of the board. Dr. Board members, do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session and to authorize Ms. Gover to sign on behalf of the board? So moved, Matt. Second. Do I have a second? So, thank you, Mr. Offerman, second. for the second. Board members, is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Tester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is report on school climate and safety. And for that, we uh, call forward Dr. Zarshan, the community superintendents, and principal of Overly, Ms. Monica Sample. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Good evening. This, presen this presentation will provide an overview of the collaborative efforts on the part of the Division of School Climate and Safety, the Division of School Support and Achievement, to ensure a, ensure a safe and supportive environment for each of our students in BCPS. The information shared will be aligned with the compass, our pathway to excellence, and opening of schools from the lens of the schoolhouse. 
I'm pleased to present on behalf of the Division of School Climate and Safety. Uh, next slide, please. Our division includes the Department of Social Emotional Support and the Department of School Safety. Together, we work with respect, responsiveness, collaboration, coordination, and trust to provide a wide range of supports to students and staff. From the school perspective, we're best known for our counselors, multi-tiered system of supports team, nurses, PPWs, residency investigators, school psychologists, school safety managers, social workers, and student conduct hearing officers. Just as equity is a responsibility that is embedded across roles and goals, the work of the Division of School Climate and Safety touches each of the COMPASS focus areas and initiatives. While our division is deeply grounded in focus area two, safe and supportive environment, we work collaboratively with all BCPS stakeholders to ensure that the goal of preparing each child to graduate ready to enter their chosen career, career training, military training, or credit-bearing college coursework is achieved for each and every one of our students. We play a key role in delivering proactive and responsive supports from preschool through high school. This school year, the challenges posed by the pandemic, social injustice, and social unrest have necessitated creative thinking and ongoing examination of the way we provide support to students, families, and staff. Next slide, please. From the onset of the current pandemic, we have worked to ensure that the students and staff have a firm foundation of safety. The foundation is essential for optimal learning and the well-rounded development of our students. In our commitment to providing and maintaining learning and workplace climates that are positive, safe, and supportive of every member of BCPS, we have developed a framework for social and emotional learning for use within our schools and offices. Staff from the Department of Social Emotional Support have supported the implementation of SEL learning experiences by providing ongoing professional development to staff. SEL activities have been incorporated into virtual learning for students in grades K to 12. SEL learning activities address problem solving, bullying, relationship skill building, personal safety skills, listening skills, celebrating differences, equity, mindfulness, coping skills, careers, self-discipline, and character development. SEL learning activities vary from grade to grade and were created to be developmentally appropriate. Next slide. Thank you. Engagement and collaboration with external partners to foster safe and equitable environments for teaching and learning have been an important part of our efforts. These partnerships go hand in hand with our work to su support the physical and social emotional wellness of our staff. An example of this work is the monthly safety emergency management steering committee led by April Lewis in the Department of School Safety. Participants in the meeting include BCPS leaders and leaders across Baltimore County, including Baltimore County Health and Human Services, Baltimore County Fire Department, and Baltimore County Police Department. The Safety and Emergency Management Steering Committees examine current challenges and proactive actions to keep Team BCPS safe and prepared to respond to potential safety concerns. At this time, I would like to introduce Ms. Monica Sample, principal of Overly High School, to share how she has supported the work of the Division of School Climate and Safety and how the division has provided support to staff and students at Overly High School. Thank you, Dr. Sarchin. Good evening, Chairwoman Kazi. Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the Board of Education. I bring you greetings from Overly High School. 
It brings me great pleasure to speak with you this evening about my wonderful experiences and partnership with my outstanding SROs and with the Office of School Climate and Safety. Overly High School is very grateful to have two outstanding SROs, one of which recently was awarded NASRO's National SRO of the Year. The SROs at Overly High School are viewed upon as valuable and respected partners who are willing to collaborate with our school family on the socio-emotional, academic, and physical well-being of our fellow team members, parents, and Overly scholars. Examples of the key roles that our SROs serve are as members of our school's restorative practices and socio-emotional teams, serving in the role of teacher by teaching all of our scholars law-related lessons that are not only engaging, but lessons that are based on the needs of our scholars that helps them to be model and productive citizens in society, and they serve as our school's biggest cheerleaders in the global community by always speaking positively of Overly and by attending extracurricular events to support our scholars. I am very proud to say that our NASRO's National SRO of the Year, SRO Moore, has served as co-coordinator of the IT Girls Mentoring Group. SRO Moore's involvement with this group empowers our most at promise female scholars that like her, they too can be a success story and role model for others by giving back to their community in a positive way and by utilizing proactive conflict resolution skills to develop healthy relationships with others. Both of our SROs are invaluable partners who ensure the safety and security of our entire school community with pride, care, and commitment. The SROs do not just collaboratively work with overly staff members and students, but they also work with another valued BCS, BCPS partner, Dr. Kelly Rudd Safran, our safety manager from the Division of School Climate and Safety. Dr. Kelly Rudd Safran, who is the safety manager for the East Zone, is considered a valuable member of the Overly team who is never too busy to assist me and my team with any safety concerns or questions. We can literally call Dr. Rudd Safran at any time and she readily and willingly comes to the school to assist with any issues that we may have. Dr. Rudd Safran assists with any safety and security issue that may affect the Overly community. She at times willingly will come and participate in restorative practices conferences or just simply to be a thought partner as it pertains to these issues. She currently supports principals socio-emotionally and in partnership by providing chats or feedback forms with the East Zone principals as it relates to common safety issues and or updates that we are experiencing during the virtual learning experience and by sending motivating and positive emails to principals to let us know we are appreciated and doing a great job. Dr. Rudd Safran is the epitome of central office support. As a building leader, I appreciate her positivity and her mantra that we are in this work together. One such example, whereas Dr. Rudd Safran helped me as a leader, is when my school community lost our beloved front office secretary to COVID-19 in May. It was a very tough time for me as a building leader to provide the support for my school family when I was grieving so heavily from the loss. Dr. Rudd Safran allowed me to grieve and facilitated the process of notifying the traumatic loss team for school support. She simply took on the role of being an anchor and partner that I could depend on to lead me through such a difficult time just by simply doing daily check-ins to check on my well-being as a leader and support me wherever she could. The traumatic loss team was wonderful with contacting me to determine my and my community's needs and providing counseling to not only our students, but our staff as well, and by providing helpful communication to express to others the loss that Overly High School was experiencing. I am very grateful for the traumatic loss team support as we navigated the grief process during the loss of our secretary. Lastly, the Office of School Climate and Safety 
has allowed me to be a collaborative partner by serving as a member of the School Safety Steering Committee. The School Safety Steering Committee allows for a wide range of collective community partners, such as the health department, various BCPS offices, the fire department, police department, and building leaders to come together as one team to discuss safety issues and proactive solutions to any concerns. As a member of the committee, I am able to offer feedback from a principal's lens on safety and security topics that directly impacts our building staff and leaders. I appreciate and value the opportunity to be a collaborative partner in helping to ensure the safety and security of Team BCPS. My experiences with the Office of School Safety and my SROs gives me great assurance as a building leader that I am not in this work alone. We are all working together to provide the best opportunities for all of our scholars and our school community. I am grateful for the partnerships with the Office of School Safety and my SROs, and I'm very appreciative of their sincere support and commitment to my school. Thank you for allowing me to share my perspective with this board. So thank you, Ms. Sample. We greatly appreciate you sharing your perspective, the leader's perspective on how we work collaboratively to ensure our students are safe. Good evening, everyone. This is Christina Byers, Community Superintendent for the Central Zone. And um, at this time, Dr. Jones, Dr. Roberts, and I are going to continue to share how our division works collaboratively with the Division of School Climate and Safety and our leaders in the schoolhouse. So in alignment to the COMPASS, our Pathway to Excellence Focus Area 1, the Division of School Support and Achievement supports schools in a research-based model that encompasses the three areas you see on your screen, instructional leadership, teaching and learning, and operational systems. This support model ensures that all parts of our system act in support of our school. And while cultivating a positive school climate can be found in many indicators of support, this evening we are going to highlight three areas. One area under instructional leadership is the school progress plan process. Our schools work through a continuous improvement cycle to ensure that they have goals aligned to the creation and implementation of a safe and secure environment. Using the Plan Do Study Act cycle of continuous improvement, our schools conduct a comprehensive needs assessment and they examine data that pertains to safety and climate. This portion of the school progress plan aligns to focus area two of the compass, safe and supportive environments. With support, our principals examine attendance data, suspension data, and our stakeholder data. Additionally, they conduct a root cause analysis to determine factors that may be contributing to their data. Our team in the Division of School Support and Achievement works with schools through that process, and then we support leadership teams in buildings with identifying action steps aligned to our teaching and learning framework in order to promote positive cultures and safe and secure environments. And finally, the school then develops a professional learning plan to support the building of adult capacity that is needed to implement those steps. At this time, Dr. Jones is going to talk about how we continue to support our schools in teaching and learning through social emotional learning. Dr. Jones. Good evening, Ms. Byers, and, and thank you. I will, as Ms. Byers said, begin speaking about social emotional learning through the lens of our school support model. DSSA works collaboratively with principals and school leadership teams to support instruction focused on social emotional learning. One way we do this is by building the capacity of our principals through our professional learning communities centered on equity and cultural responsiveness. Through collaboration with the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency, our team holds these professional learning communities to examine anti-racist work that is critical in our schools and the social emotional needs of students within a school community 
or given feeder pattern. We support various programs, including conscious discipline, our elementary counseling curriculum, and restorative practices, to name a few. Additionally, there are a myriad of support teams at the school level, student support teams, IEP teams, attendance committees, climate committees, and other school-based committees that serve our students and their various needs. Our DSSA team continues to support schools and bridging networks with our itinerant support staff in the Division of School Climate and Safety. Dr. Roberts will share more about school safety and our supports through the lens of operational systems. Dr. Roberts. Great, thank you, Dr. Jones. In the operational systems portion of the support model, we work specifically with schools on their procedures, processes, and protocols that support school safety and climate. One such process in the school-based safety plan, or is the school-based safety plan. Each and every school develops a safety plan to align to the uniqueness of their school. While every plan has the same components and requirements, each school must customize their plan based on their, their facility, student body, and staff. Our team, along with the Department of School Safety and our partners in the Baltimore County Police and Fire Departments, have access to these plans. For safety reasons, these plans are not public. A critical, a critical component of the plan is how and when schools implement drills to practice universal emergency response procedures. Our website does contain a forward-facing document that explains to parents what is meant by each universal emergency response. Another process we support is regarding critical incident reporting. Though every incident is unique, the following general protocol is followed between schools and the divisions of school support and climate and school safety. If the, if the emergency requires first responders, the school calls 911 and then immediately notifies the respective zone office and safety manager. The incident is then monitored and subsequent appropriate communications are delivered to the appropriate stakeholders at the appropriate times in accordance with the Baltimore County Police Department. For incidents that do not require intervention from our first responders, principals contact their respective zone office and safety manager. Collectively, this team um, leads and monitors the incident um, and provides appropriate supportive strategies. If needed, subsequent appropriate communication is delivered to the appropriate stakeholders. Supportive strategies may involve school personnel and the Division of School Climate and Safety, as well as our own mental health partners. And finally, as you heard so wonderfully from Monica Sample, our division and our schools are fortunate that we get to work every day and work collaboratively um, with our school resource officers and our school resource office and safety managers. Having a safety manager for each zone provides timely support to our schools and other staff within our buildings. The Division of School Support and Achievement, principals, safety managers, and SROs use collaborative teamwork to support schools when they are faced with issues of safety and security. So at this time, this does conclude our presentation on school climate and safety. Um, on behalf of the team and Ms. Sample, we'd like to thank you for your time and attention and we're available for any questions. Thank you. Board members, if you could uh, use the raise your hand icon to uh, engage in discussion. Or if you are calling in, if you can alert me that you would like to speak. Ms. Rowe, you may begin. Hey, I would just like to um, thank you for this presentation, but I would also like to know what specific work have you done as far as um, putting together ideas for safety protocols, social distancing, masks, um, things like that, or once schools are reopened. Because we've seen the difference in this plan. Once students are sitting in the building, what is going to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the building? So we've spent a great deal of time talking about mitigation measures. Uh, you mentioned social distancing, wearing of mask provisions. If students or staff don't have masks with them, um, actually even before you get in a school or office, we've got reminders um, about practices and protocols at each doorway. Um, and that's been a big part of our work when folks are exposed outside of school to COVID we're finding that exposure to colleagues in school has been very low because of staff following those measures. Uh, that same work uh, will lead us to uh, 
when the students come back and staff in, in larger numbers, um, we have spent a great deal of time, not just with our staff in health services um, and Deb Somerville's leadership there, but also with uh, the Department of Health for Baltimore County. They have been great support uh, as we've gone through this, this work. Okay, my second and last question is, what measures are going to take place as far as contact tracing and quarantining of students, teachers, schools, et cetera, when someone is tested with COVID-19? Thank you for that question. Uh, so we, a big part of the work of nurses right now, uh, they are involved in contact tracing, uh, not only in BCPS when a staff tests positive, but also in the county supporting the Department of Health. I believe Deb Somerville is on and, and she may be the best person to walk through the details of that work. Ms. Somerville? I am on, I missed the question a bit. Can, could you repeat the question to me, Dr. Dr. Zartan? Uh, can you speak to the work on contact tracing? Oh, okay, sure, yes. So we're doing contact tracing right now um, for all any employee who tests positive. So that involves an immediate call to the employee to determine the timeline for the illness and when they were potentially infectious to identify their activities and their contacts in BCPS buildings. Um, and then we notify anyone who had close contact, put them on quarantine, refer them for testing, all in collaboration with our partners at the Department of Health. Um, we feel like this um, summer and the spring have really provided us a great time to refine our contact tracing process. Um, we always end the contact tracing process after a case with a community notice letter to all persons who are in the building. Um, who don't have close contact, but notifying them that that can occur. Ms. Rowe, does that complete your questions and answers? I just didn't hear the answers about what it will mean for students. Will students contact face quarantined and notified? Ms. Rowe, could you repeat that because there was some feedback and I want to make sure that Dr. Zarshan and Ms. Somerville can uh, hear your full question and then respond. Well, my primary question was about students being contact-based notified in quarantine. So when students return to the building, will the same protocols currently be used for staff be used for students? Yes, uh, uh, this is Ms. Somerville. Yes, essentially, although the um, reporting will occur through our school nurses, so the school nurses will primarily report it to our office. And when students um, are back in the building, there is a closer reporting process with the Department of Health. So there will be um, a kind of an outbreak lens that's added to it for each case. But other than that, the process will be the same. The family will be contacted, will contact persons who have close contact. Um, we'll be collaborating with teachers to identify, obviously, persons that have close contact, um, and um, we'll do the community notice letter. So, yes, essentially the same process. Thank you. Thank you. And the um, next hand that was raised was Mr. Kuhn, and then it will be Dr. Hager, and then Mr. Mahamza. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Causey. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Um, the, the only question that I have for the team uh, that has been presenting here is where are all the materials that, um, that you've talked about today available for people to find on BCPS, BCPS's website? It, Well, maybe I should start by asking, are the materials available that outline everything that you've all been talking about to the public at this point in time? Let's start there. 
So, Mr. Kuhn, I can address the portion that I referenced on the universal emergency response on our safety webpage, uh, so on the bcps.org and the Office of School Safety and Climate, should be a, a reference document to the universal emergency response, what's meant by each of them. Um, that's where the community can find those located items um, with reference to the various types of emergencies and, and the response. The safety plans, again, aren't public. The safety plans live behind the scenes with our police department and our fire department in terms of the school safety plans and their, emer and their emergency drilling um, exercises and their, and their logs. And the only thing I would add to that, Dr. Roberts, is that um, as a school system, Mr. Kuhn, we do have a comprehensive safety plan, and that comprehensive safety plan is where those universal procedures live, and that can be found um, on our public website um, under the Department of Safety. And then for the school progress plan, which I referenced, um, each school does publish a one-page snapshot of their individual school progress plan to their school's website. And then in terms of some of the, um, the pieces of the curriculum in terms of um, that programs that we use curriculum in terms of conscious discipline and or restorative practices, there are materials available to our teachers through um, Schoology. And we work very closely with the Office of Academics to make sure that our teachers have exactly what they need and the training to be able to implement those programs. Dr. Jones, are those materials yes. available to parents and and people in the community to see? So there are um, materials that are available to parents and some schools have provided some of the restorative practice and all conscious discipline materials just to kind of make sure that parents are aware of the programs as they're being implemented. Um, I can find out more information as to where they are located or how families can access those generally those types of materials or that information is provided during back to school nights and or teacher parent conferences or meetings that take place at school but i can find out more um, i'm sure it's on our website but i'll find out exactly where you can find that information okay thank you very much and next we have dr hager Hi, yes, and um, thank you for that presentation. Um, my questions are really more on the school climate side in a pre-pandemic world or hopefully a post-pandemic world. Um, is the school progress plan the same as a school improvement plan? I think they used to call them those. Yeah. Yes, there is, it's, the same, it's the same concept. Okay. Um, so we, uh, as a board, we were invited to attend the MABE annual meeting, which is the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. And this year, the, um, the focus area for the meeting was the whole child. And so clearly social emotional learning is a component of you know, the whole school, whole child, whole community model, where we think about um, overall school wellness and wellness for students. And I know in the past with school improvement plans, that, you know, under the climate kind of reporting, folks would report on wellness initiatives. And I was a little concerned that the model that you're using only includes social emotional learning and not other components of school wellness. So I guess one question I have is in the school progress plan, are you required to report on social emotional learning or any sort of holistic wellness um, setting the goals around social emotional learning or, or overall wellness goals? And um, how, so that's one question. And then my second question is how does the, this office work with uh, policy 5470, which is the wellness policy, thinking about, again, the whole child and addressing the needs of the whole child. So um, I'll start and then this is uh, Christina Byers and then obviously any of my team members can jump in. Um, the school progress plan does um, look at school climate um, and overall social emotional learning. So to answer your first question, the answer is yes. Schools do set goals based on um, data sources that they are analyzing that pertain to school climate, whether that be um, stakeholder uh, data around things like belonging, um, whether that be attendance data or suspension data. So they do set a specific goal around school climate. The other piece that you were talking about, equally as important, um, around the whole child, does directly correlate to the policy you referenced in that every school does have a wellness committee. And so while that is not um, 
embedded necessarily within the individual school progress plan. All schools are charged with having a wellness liaison and they work um, within the school to um, look at the implementation of that policy in that individual school setting. Yeah, I noticed um, of, the, of the committees, I know you were just uh, talking off the top of your head, Some one, one of the speakers was uh, wellness committees were not mentioned, and so I was wondering kind of how that all fit together. Um, and how long has safety and climate been linked together in the same office? Is this a new phenomenon or has it been this way for a long time? This is the third year. Third year. Yes. Okay. Um, I think those are all of my questions. Um, thank you for your time. Mr. Mahamsa? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yeah, before I ask my question, I want I wanted to go on a short tangent for a second. Uh, many of uh, many people don't know that the first time I met um, the chief of climate and safety, Dr. Zerchin, was about a year ago. Uh, this was during my role as um, on the student councils uh, and primarily the uh, the committee on uh, safety. And uh, I was happy that Dr. Zerchin. Uh, through our conversation, took the opportunity uh, to come down to Dundalk uh, to really see uh, what the students were talking about and some of the concerns they had. Uh, and it, it was my first time ever being in a leadership position. And Dr. Zerchin, I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing that. Uh, that conversation really inspired me uh, at that time and it made me really run for this position. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zerchin. Uh, my question was, concerning a uh, kind of like what Dr. Uh, Hager was talking about, uh, the post-COVID uh, or uh, post-COVID uh, school environment. And mainly it deals with students uh, reporting uh, issues concerning climate and safety. And I think I've talked to Ms. Dr. Byers, uh, Ms. Byers about this, about students feeling like they can't uh, go to their principals, their teachers, and might need to reach out to an uh, external body for help to address their concerns. And my question is, what is the Office of Climate uh, doing uh, to allow for these, uh, for students to, uh, I guess, I guess report uh, incidences or concerns they have? Uh, yeah. So Mr. Mahomes, I will, this is Dr. Roberts. Um, I'll, if I could, I'll open and address some of that question and certainly, um, allow my colleagues to follow up. It's a, and it's a great question. I mean, we, we say in education and as educators that there should be, every child should have a connection within the building. Um, so if that person's not an administrator, not a teacher per se, it could be um, a custodial worker, it could be a cafeteria worker, it could be a paraprofessional, an instructional assistant, just some adult, a school counselor, some adult within the building who they can go to, who they feel comfortable with. But in hearing your question, sometimes there may be a case where a child or a student doesn't feel comfortable with an adult in the building. Um, and sometimes they're just feeling comfortable with their own peers or a particular peer or a small group of peers. So to the larger question around school climate, it really does wrap around also um, to the work in our family engagement office and several other offices within um, our mentoring office and curriculum instruction. So several kind of divisions um, outside of school climate, but certainly within school climate, um, help in addressing, for example, student government. So if a student has a, a student leader, such as yourself, who they're comfortable with, what we also work and try to do um, is to allow our students to understand that they can go to um, a trusted friend um, and maybe that friend can provide that intervention and go to a trusted adult with information on behalf of their friend or on behalf of a student. So it's really student leaders like yourself who could serve in that capacity. Other ways we do, we heard Mrs. Sample talk about um, Dr. Safran Rudd, who is absolutely, she was right on, hit the nail right on the head um, with Dr. Rudd Safran. She is absolutely an amazing leader within our school community, and we're so lucky to have her on the East Zone. I say that to say that what she does is she will meet with students. So we in central office 
also take the opportunity to come in and build relationships with students. Your comments, your pointed comments referencing Dr. Zarchin is another great example. You made a connection with the central office staff member who you then felt comfortable going to and would feel comfortable going to. So what we do in central office too is in terms of working within buildings in any capacity is to build connections and talk with children. So because you never know, you're talking to that child and you don't know sometimes as an adult, you're making an impression and building a connection where they may feel comfortable reaching out. So those, I just want to kind of frame that in a response that hopefully addresses your question, Mr. Hamza, um, in ways that central office, but as well as student leaders within buildings can serve um, in that capacity of supporting one another. So I don't know if so, anyone else. Yeah, so thank, thank you, thank you, Doc, thank you Dr. Roberts. I'm going to ask um, Dr. Zarchin just to add to that response. Thank you. Well, well first, I want to thank Mr. Mahamza for the opportunity to go out and visit. That was a uh, highlight of the year, and I look forward to getting back in the building with you with the rest of the students uh, to talk some more. Uh, this summer, we spent a, a good amount of time working with our, our school leaders and teachers to educate them, provide professional development. We knew that there was going to be a need for connections and outreach and identifying when students weren't engaged or they may be showing signs of, of potential mental health issues. So that was done early on and I think has been really important. I, I'm pleased to share uh, we have had it just recently a number of examples where students have reached out to staff in times of need and, and crisis. So I'm very pleased with that. I think part of that's relationships that have long existed. And I'd like to think of that part of that is the awareness through that professional development that occurred over the summer. Yeah, uh, and that's great, uh, Dr. Zarchin. And, uh, and I, I think what is terrific, and Dr. Um, my, um, Roberts mentioned, was about uh, the connections, especially with student leaders they're making. But uh, what I was thinking about is the students who really uh, can't go to those, uh, can't contact the office staff, uh, staff personally or feel scared in some uh, way. Um, is there is there tools? Uh, one example I used is I know that the governor's office has the app, the school safety app, where they can they can submit uh, an alert or something, and um, somebody will get back to them. Are there tools like those available where students can submit sometimes even anonymously uh, issues they have and to alert you guys, especially? I'm so. There's a call in that students can can make. I think most importantly are the teams in schools. Um, when a student's not engaged or their concerns, a teacher can work with a counselor who can work with an administrator, folks who may know the student or may not know the student well. But when when red flags come up, there's outreach um, and connections made. Um, that's been really important with you know, this online learning. Um, and, and it's 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 a new thing, um, and we're still learning and growing. But those teams in schools have really made a difference um, in, in connecting with students and getting them support. And sometimes it's connecting with outside agencies. Once those connections are made, um, we also have tip lines um, that come in. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zarkson. And thank you uh, to the principal from Overly, and congratulations to our SRO of the year, uh, Ms. Moore. Thank you. Ms. Pasteur? Thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations and thank you to everyone who has um, presented. And I did owe the congratulations to Ms. Moore and always to the very wonderful Monica Sample for uh, her award last year and the good work she does in her high school. Um, Dr. Zarchin and, and Ms. Somerville, I would just like to sort of follow up on Mr. Kuhn's question. Where might parents and students and teachers look so they have a sense of what uh, is being planned in terms of safeguarding our students as they return? Um, or how do they know or from where are they going to get that information? Are all principals 
saying the same thing, sending out letters. How do they know, how do they feel comfortable uh, about our plans? And not just for the physical or the health safety, but also for the um, social, emotional, and mental. And what kind of um, uh, professional development, I guess, um, during this time where people are still out, are principals getting so that they're all on the same page as folks start going in, well, they are already in, and how they uh, are going to have these discussions with their student bodies as well as their staff as students and teachers come in. I heard things you were saying, they're good. I just want to know how folks can get the information and how this translates into um, making sure we're all doing the same thing all the time. Thank you for that question. So we have resources on the web page uh, for students, staff, and parents on, on a, a variety of topics um, to help educate and, and get folks through this difficult time. Uh, we will also be doing biweekly updates um, from the design team and the COVID task force uh, that will be shared with, with everyone as well. Um, Deb Somerville, did you, did you want to share any more information about information that we've provided to this point? No, I don't think so. Thank you. It, we, we have quite a bit online and we continue to add to that. And as we get closer to a return, you know, that communication will only continue. Okay, so parents, everyone will know, staff will know that everyone will be in sync so that as the return happens, everyone will be in sync in terms of how they talk to the children and how they talk to the staff. As far as the, the principals or school leaders? Yes, yes. I want to just make sure that from school to school, folks are not doing different things and, and having different expectations, that everyone is of the same mind in the system as people are returning in terms of the safety protocols and the mental and social health protocols. Yes, and that's been one of the Thank challenges you. as we get new information and, and we learn you know, through this pandemic is coordinating information, staying on the same message, and making sure that, that we're, we're putting the information out there and keeping it up to date. And that's work that will continue. So, so uh, this, um, I, this is Debbie jumping in, Ms. Pastor. Uh, two mm -hmm. thoughts that I wanted to add is there is, um, all of the employees had to complete a COVID 101 course. It's talked about the key mitigation strategies and really introduced the common language that we're going to be using about social distancing, mask wearing, and those kinds of things. Um, in addition, we have um, a, um, a training program that the school nurses will be delivering when staff return. So that training program um, has been drafted for the four separate public day schools. Um, and the principals have actually just reviewed it, health reviewed it. So that will be used also as staff returns for consistent training and um, review for staff on protocol. Thank you. And just Another, to add, oh, just to add, ahead. this is Dr. Williams, just to add that the community superintendents and or executive directors meet regularly, I'm gonna say weekly with their principals to provide updates um, updates from various offices, updates from their offices. So that's been helpful as well. Just wanted to add that information. Thank you. We've also been working with the Department of Health, Health Services, our design team, community superintendents, to put together information in a, a health guideline document that will be shared uh, with everyone on the website. Uh, we're calling it our Safety is Our True North document. And that has a lot of information about um, different guidelines, social emotional well being, uh, monitoring, um, right across the board, health and safety information. Thank you. Ms. Pasture, does that complete your questions? 
Yes, I'm, I'm done and my hand is down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other board members? Mr. Mahamza, is your hand back up? No. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll take a moment and ask some questions. First, I wanted to say um, it was my pleasure and honor to attend Officer Danielle Moore's award ceremony when she uh, became the National Association School Resource Officer of the Year. Uh, which is an incredible award because there are over 14,000 SROs um, that work in schools in the United States. And uh, that's just a wonderful collaboration that she has with the principal and the students and the families of Overly High School. I did want to ask, going back to um, Ms. Byers with the um, school safety and climate and the Wellness Committee. And I wanted to understand who's on the Wellness Committee and how does that operate in the virtual environment and how does the school progress plan relate to uh, the virtual environment? Hi, good evening again. So the, the Wellness Committee is an individual, um, the leadership team at individual schools determine who really is the makeup of that. The requirement by the um, policy and rule is that there be a wellness liaison. And so that is the person who really leads the charge within a school around that committee and ensuring that the policy is being implemented. Um, in terms of the school progress plan, um, schools continue to focus on their goals and their actions that are aligned to those goals. And so our leadership teams within our schools do continue to meet regularly. Um, all schools have meeting structures where they meet in the virtual environment and they um, engage in activities that are aligned to their school progress plans, whether that be to monitor the implementation of the professional learning plan, to examine data that is aligned to monitoring their school progress plan, um, or simply discussing, discussing the implementation of the action steps that they identified in alignment to their goals. So similar to the way that they would normally, uh, as a leadership team, meet face-to-face -face in the schoolhouse, they are still conducting those um, leadership team meetings virtually. You're muted, Ms. Causey. Thank you. This uh, question is for Dr. Zarshan and I, going back to the safety manager and their role, what specifically has been their role in um, the COVID pandemic this semester, uh, including you know, the virtual environment, but also as plans are developed to return students to school? So they are still working with schools, checking in. Um, we are actually getting ready to, to begin safety managers going into schools and doing a checklist to make sure that their mitigation strategies are in place uh, and being used uh, consistently in schools and offices. Uh, that is something we've worked through with the Department of Health. Uh, we've got their feedback on the form and just yesterday, um, that was approved to move forward. So that'll be a big part of their work in the near future. Um, I have April Lewis on as well, if you'd like more details about the work they've been doing. Actually, that would be great because we are hearing a number of concerns and it's um, good to hear from you and your team and the others that are directly addressing these issues. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And so during the pandemic, the safety managers continue uh, to consult with schools, consult with um, police. They have established guidelines for when we involve law enforcement in the virtual environment. Um, they've also been monitoring schools, going out to schools, um, visiting, even when the schools were closed, to make sure that our facilities um, were safe. We've been working on the revisions in our process to drills um, because of COVID. The schedule is going to be quite different. So we're having to customize the plans in a different way 
um, because the expectations for our drills will be different as we return to school. So they've been quite busy um, working with the principals. They've been working on revisions to the comprehensive safety plan um, during this time, just making sure that once our students start to return to school, that they're ready to address the concerns that come up. Thank you. And um, my final question to Dr. Zarshan is, so when we hear concerns about the safety of students and staff and dealing with the impacts of the pandemic, um, you feel that the schools are going to be able to address the safety of our students as they return to school? Yes. Uh, we So as we return, there's going to be anxiety about a return with students that we're, we're trying to position ourselves to, to make sure that we have staff available to work with students. Um, and, and there's, it, we're in a different spot right now. There, it, sadly, there's no perfect plan or response. If we stay home, we worry about mental health issues. When we return to school, we worry about physical health issues and a combination on both sides of this equation. So our MTSS folks are busy doing training. Uh, school social workers mm -hmm. are involved with telehealth services. Uh, psychologists are, are providing social emotional supports, parent workshops, uh, trauma informed support training has been and will continue to be a critical part of the adult learning that we do. Thank you very much. But but it's also uh, the adult learning, but it also is what you're translating to provide to the students. And I'm glad yes. to hear about the trauma informed because the COVID uh, has provided a lot of trauma to our students and families and staff. And, um, you know, we know that um, that those need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any other discussion before we move to the next agenda item? Well, thank you, Dr. Zarshan, uh, Dr. Uh, Jones, Mr. Robert, oh no, Dr. Roberts, and uh, Ms. Lewis, and also Ms. Somerville, thank you. We are moving to the next agenda item, which is the presentation on curriculum. Excuse me. It's a report on reading from Dr. McComas, our chief of curriculum. So welcome, Dr. McComas. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's so good to be here this evening with you. Um, um, so I'm sorry, I should be more formal. Good evening, Dr. Williams, uh, Chair Causey, and members of the board. I'm uh, Dr. McComas, our Chief Academic Officer, and I'm joined this evening by two um, fantastic literacy leaders within BCPS, uh, Ms. Jennifer Kraft, our Director of English Language Arts, and Ms. Megan Shea, our Executive Director of Academics. And this evening, we are very pleased to bring to the board and all of our stakeholders who are joining us this evening um, and a high-level overview of effective literacy instruction within BCPS. Um, and as we get started, I'd also just like to remind everyone, um, because I know you will be excited and you will want to understand more, I would encourage everyone to go back at some point and view the March 2019 uh, Curriculum Committee um, archive, and you'll be able to have an even deeper dive and take that at your leisure. So on that, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And Mr. Corns, if you could kindly go to the next slide. Thank you. And so this evening, as always, we'd like to ground into our presentation this evening um, and ensure that everyone understands how it fits into the critical work of our organization and specifically our strategic plan. Under the leadership of Dr. Williams, as everyone is aware, uh, we launched our new strategic plan this year, uh, which we affectionately refer to as the COMPASS, our pathway to excellence. Um, and it has uh, five focus areas. Focus area number one is, of course, our core mission of learning, accountability, and results. And so what we will share with you today is really one of the fundamental aspects of learning 
um, within any school system. So on that, I will hand it over uh, to Ms. Shea and she will pick up. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Next slide, please, Mr. Corns. Good evening, everyone. Um, so when talking about reading, it is really important that we understand the complexities and the multifaceted skills required for proficient reading. Um, Mr. Corns, if you can advance, I apologize. I think there's animation. Um, you can click through a few more times. Thank you so much. One more thank you, perfect, right there. Thank you so much. Um, so our esteemed members of the curriculum committee will recall um, this graphic, I'm sure, and the pipe cleaner activity that we did along with it. Um, this is a rope model developed by researcher Hollis Scarborough. And what this rope model attempts to do is to help visualize the multifaceted skills required for proficient reading. So if you look on the bottom of this diagram, you'll see the area of word recognition. This encompasses areas of reading including phonological awareness, decoding and spelling, or phonics, as well as sight recognition. On the left-hand side with the rainbow colored boxes, these represent the five critical areas of reading as defined by the National Reading Panel. And you'll see how those areas of reading overlap with the Scarborough's rope. The bottom component of word recognition is the primary goal and focus area for primary grade instruction. This is also the area that our strategy um, 2A within that goal area of learning accountability and results is focused on the implementation of our curriculum resource in open court. So thanks to the support of this board and our budget, we have been able to implement the open court curriculum, which Ms. Kraft will talk about in a few moments. At the top of the rope, this is the additional area of um, important language comprehension necessary for skilled reading. This is where we instruct students to develop background knowledge, um, vocabulary, the structure of language or syntax, as well as to develop ver verbal reasoning and literacy knowledge. As our readers move explicitly through the primary grades, they are developing the skills necessary to become increasingly automatic and increasingly strategic so that they can ultimately become skilled readers who then move into the intermediate grades as well as middle and high school using those proficient reading skills to learn across the disciplines. You'll see on the orange arrow, the goal of curriculum in reading instruction is to develop these explicit and systematic skills by the end of grade two, so that as students move into grade three and beyond, they are able to apply fluent execution and coordination of both word recognition and text comprehension. What can make reading instruction very complex for students and families and teachers is that the needs of any individual reader might demonstrate a need in any one of these strands. Because again, it is that coordination and that weaving together of those discrete skills that results in proficient reading. Next slide, please. This visual model of what it means to develop proficient readers is also reflected in our expectations for the classroom. So as Dr. McComas shared, within focus area one, learning accountability and results in our compass, we have our teaching and learning framework. The teaching and learning framework sets forth clear expectations for teaching and learning in every classroom every day. Here we outline how these expectations are applied for literacy. On the left-hand side, you can see some of the explicit expectations for literacy instruction in the primary grades that reflect the systematic and explicit instruction of phonemic awareness, phonics, and word study. Again, these are accomplished through our new curriculum that we now have implemented in grades K through three. In addition, in the elementary grades, it is critically important that students have daily opportunities to read and interact with text of sufficient complexity and increasing text complexity in both literature and nonfiction as they move through those elementary grades, and that they have opportunities to write daily, both in short time frames and extended time frames for a range of tasks, purposes, and audiences. As we move into middle school and high school, we now want our students to have authentic disciplinary literacy experiences and opportunities. This is where we are hoping our students will use that skilled reading developed through that explicit and systematic instruction in the elementary grades to apply to authentic learning within the disciplines of science, social studies, reading, fine arts, and career and technology education, for example. 
We want students to have already mastered the individual skills necessary for proficient reading so that they might focus their cognitive effort on applying those literacy skills to read and write authentically within the disciplines. Our reading curriculum is also centered around a multi-tiered system of supports. And as I transition, I want to introduce our Director of English Language Arts, Ms. Jennifer Kraft. She did join us last year just before we closed um, for the pandemic and shifted to virtual learning. And so this is her first opportunity to be with the board this evening. And I'm so pleased to have her join our team. And she's going to walk us through how these expectations for literacy instruction are reflected in a multi-tiered system of curriculum resources and implementation. Next slide, please, and Ms. Kraft. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Good evening. So happy to be here tonight. What you see in front of you is our elementary reading multi-tiered system of support. And so on the pyramid, you'll see on one side our comprehension and the other side decoding. And when we think about a multi-tiered system of support, it's going to have four basic components. It's going to have multi-tiered levels of prevention and support, evidence-based programs with high quality instruction, ongoing assessment, and data-based decision-making and problem solving. Uh, MTSS has three tiers. Um, so you'll see on that bottom level, tier one is our universal instruction. This is the differentiated evidence-based core instruction that all students receive. Core instruction will meet the needs of most students, but some students will require tier two. So that blue tier two band really is supplemental short-term small group interventions to improve student-specific reading skills. And then finally, at the top of the pyramid, our yellow strip is tier three, intensive intervention, which is extremely focused standalone interventions for students who continue to have acute difficulties in reading despite efforts in tier one and tier two. It's important to recognize that the tiers describe intensity of instruction, not specific programs, students, or staff. Each tier is layered on the previous tier's level of support. So in BCPS, for our tier one, we have Wonders, our BCPS written curriculum, and Open Court as part of our tier one instruction. Additionally, we have trained many of our teachers on letters, which helps teachers to understand that effective reading instruction is complex with several related key components based on current scientific research. Letters explain spoken and written English language structures to students and how to implement instructional routines, activities, and approaches to differentiate instruction to meet literacy needs for all students. Importantly, we have collaborated with both the Office of ESOL and the Office of Special Education around both core instruction and interventions to ensure that we meet the needs of all students through a comprehensive and coordinated approach. And so while we are looking at the elementary right now and you can see the different uh, programs that we do have in place to support our students, we're now gonna take a minute and look at our secondary reading multi-tiered systems of support. Next slide, please. So the same tiers are in effect. I just want to add a couple more layers to the multi-tiered system of support. Uh, so when we're talking about a multi-tiered system of support, we should be using evidence-based interventions. And an evidence-based intervention is one that is supported by strong research evidence demonstrating its effectiveness. So it's going to demonstrate a statistically significant effect on improving student reading outcomes or it will demonstrate a rational based on high quality research findings or positive evaluation that the activity, strategy, or intervention is likely to improve student outcomes or other relevant outcomes. Research indicates that one of the most common reasons that teachers do not get the anticipated results is that they have not properly implemented the program as intended or with fidelity. Fidelity of implementation occurs when teachers use a program in exactly the same way that it was designed to be used and delivered. And so one thing that we focus on, again, in the collaboration with the Office of Special Education and the Office of ESOL, is ensuring that all of our teachers have training in the programs as well as job embedded support and opportunities to come together to learn the program. And so we have several layers of support to ensure that these programs can be delivered with fidelity. It's also important to note that the shifts that we were making in elementary school, such as implementing open court in grades K through three, ultimately will result in lower numbers of students in high school and middle school needing reading intervention over time. Next slide. 
Thank you, Ms. Kraft. So Ms. Kraft just described all of the curriculum resources and some of the universal professional learning offered at each of the tiers of support. But as the Division of Curriculum and Instruction, we know equal to our responsibility to provide high quality evidence-based resources for curriculum, so too are we committed to providing instructional support through professional learning and a service and support model for schools. One way that we provide universal supports to all schools is through our support of reading specialists in the elementary schools and department chairs in the middle and high schools. We work each month to provide professional learning opportunities for data analysis and collaborative planning, as well as resources to support specific programs or curriculum materials for both reading specialists and department chairs each month. In addition, we work collaboratively. You saw this graphic earlier when the Division of School Support and Achievement was talking about their interaction with school climate and safety. We also work collaboratively with the Division of School Support and Achievement to support our schools, our school leaders, and our classroom teachers through what we call our residency model. In the residency model, resource teachers from the Office of English Language Arts are assigned to support an individual school for a specific length of time. During that time, they provide job embedded coaching, working collaboratively with the school-based instructional leadership team to support the literacy needs of students and of teachers, as well as building capacity for that leadership team to continue to provide supports towards the action steps and goals outlined in the school progress plan. In addition, the English Language Arts Office supports the instructional core team, which is additional layer of support identified by the Division of School Support and Achievement. Also outlined in our compass is our commitment to providing support for general education and content teachers' knowledge of the necessary support for English learners. English learners are continuing to develop literacy in their L1 or first language while also working to explicitly develop literacies in English. In the same manner, we collaborate closely with the Office of Special Education. As Ms. Croft noted, it is through a braiding of our funds and our professional learning opportunities that we are able to provide support for both general and special educators who are working to support the needs of students receiving special education services, specifically in the areas of developing literacy. And finally, we also provide collaboration and services support to support the advanced needs of students receiving advanced academics. In some cases, this includes providing opportunities for more complex text or for op opportunities for true integration across the multiple disciplines. Next slide. And finally, we know that our literacy data that we have been working through for several years tells us that the efforts that we've made universally for redefining our curriculum and supporting professional learning are not enough. We know that in addition to the evidence-based resources aligned to standards, it is equally critical that we interrogate our curriculum to disrupt the inequities and outcomes for reading achievement by race. To do this, we have a renewed emphasis and focus on ensuring culturally relevant pedagogy in all of our literacy classrooms. Culturally responsive teaching teaches to and through students' personal and cultural strengths and intellectual capabilities by providing curriculum content and teaching strategies through their cultural frames of reference to make the context more personally meaningful and easier to master. You can see reflected here on the slide that this means teachers approach students' cultural and linguistic differences through an asset mindset and incorporate them fully into the learning process. In addition, teachers understand the importance of represent representation and promote student identities by intentionally selecting curriculum resources and material. To this end, in the last several years, we have made some very deliberate shifts, including working to form an affinity group for our curriculum writers and to provide explicit training resources and pedagogy to support culturally responsive instruction, as well as developing tools to conduct an audit of our own curriculum resources to ensure that we are intentionally selecting those resources to truly reflect and represent the students that we serve. Next slide. And Dr. McComas, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. And I believe from uh, according to the agenda, we have about 12 minutes in this part of the agenda. And 
we're open to questions. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, board members, I see um, Ms. Mack and then other board members can use the hand icon or if you do not have it, just uh, chime in when you would uh, like to speak. Ms. Mack. Thank you very much, Dr. McComas um, and Ms. Shea, and I'm sorry, I forgot the other person's name. Ms. Kraft. Ms. Kraft, thank you very much for that information. So one of the slides indicated that um, students are expected to read independently at the secondary level. Yet, as I often bring up, 68.3% of our sixth graders and 66.4% of our 10th graders are not reading at grade level. I appreciate the information provided about tiered supports. I am encouraged by the fact that our youngest learners are being taught the right way. But I am very concerned that so many of our students are not reading on grade level. And I wonder if, if, there's, if we can actually catch them up. Um, one of the questions I often ask is, with that many students not being proficient in reading, why do we have a practice of continuing to push kids on to the next grade? Um, many teachers tell me all of the time that they try to hold students back and they're not allowed to do that. So I'd like to understand our rationale about continuing to grade level promote kids who are not ready. Um, I'd like to understand if we anticipate any changes in that, given that so many kids are struggling in virtual learning. And then finally, I'd like to know that given our virtual attendance policy, um, how do we know that students who are being marked present are even attending ELA, math, or any academic subject? And and what are we doing to ensure that the students are getting the instructional hours they need to truly be successful? Thank you, Ms. Mack. I know there were, uh, that's a multi-tiered uh, series of questions. So if you'll just bear with us as we try to remember all of them and work through them. And I can ask, um, if you have questions, just ask me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so I will, and it, and my team will also help uh, with these questions. So I'll get us started here by saying, um, first, uh, it, it's a really important. First, we too have concerns about our data, right? Because we know our fundamental mission is to help our students fundamentally become literate um, so that they can then be successful in all other realms of their life. So we truly, um, are equally as urgent about improving our outcomes for our children. Um, next, I would also say that, um, as, as you know, because I know when we had that uh, curriculum committee presentation, we really spent some time um, identifying how important it is to have tr a good diagnostic understanding of the root cause of a child struggling to become a fluent uh, and proficient reader, right? And that it was important for us as a system to have that multi-tiered system of support so that we can match the right treatment for uh, the root cause or the need of the student as they're um, striving to become uh, more proficient. So uh, we, and I wanna say that we as a team greatly appreciate the opportunity always to talk to our board about the need to have that, that menu uh, so that we can match the right um, um, supports to our learners as it becomes evident what their support need is. Um, so that is a step in the right direction that we are doing. You know, just as, as recent as I think it was last January, we uh, were bringing forward the visualizing and verbalizing. I think it was January, it's starting to blur together uh, because of the COVID. Um, and so that was a new intervention that we were layering in. So that is part of their, their work moving forward. Um, and then I would also, I'll come back at the end and talk about attendance. Um, so I, I want to make sure I give Ms. Shea and Ms. Kraft if they have um, other comments to add to uh, sort of the, the piece around how do we address um, students and moving them forward. Um, Ms. Dr. McComas, can I just add something to that? Because in a perfect world, when a student hits the 10th grade, there is 10th grade curriculum that that student should be focused on. But when we're putting efforts with that student and catching that student up, he or she is never 
getting the same opportunities that a student who goes into the 10th grade able to read on 10th at the 10th grade level gets. We're, they're, they're always running behind because they're always trying to catch up. Well, I, I would certainly agree, Ms. Mack, that it is um, double work when a student is, is working to overcome a challenge. It's important also to recognize that brain development does occur at different rates. And while we like to have a conventional model where all students arrive at a certain level by a certain grade, I'll just speak um, authentically as a mom of one of my own children who um, had a reading uh, disability. And it, her, it just took her longer to get to where most children could get to. That wasn't a defect of her. It wasn't a defect sure. of her teachers. It was a function of human brain development. And I think that that's important for us to keep in mind too, so that um, you know, while we like to have conventions, we need to recognize each and every child will grow and develop in their pace. And our challenge as, as the educators and adults in their life is to truly take the time to understand them, to understand their needs, and then to um, find what is the right resource along that journey. Um, and so I just ask that we always keep the, the compelling human quality in this conversation as well. Um, and then I would also speak authentically as someone who was a high school teacher who did teach 10th grade and often had students in my um content classes that were striving readers. Um, and it was incumbent on me, in addition to the reading um, specialists that they may have been working with, to recognize that it's not one before the other. At that point, you need to work together in tandem. That's why it's important for our content teachers to really have disciplinary literacy skills and to understand what are those discipline-specific literacy strategies to help students become proficient um, in, in the robustness of their content, rather that's biology or economics or some of the other areas. I'm sorry, I am gonna turn it over because I get passionate about this and I wanna give others an opportunity. I think, uh, you're, doing Ms. I, I think you're doing a wonderful job, Dr. McCormick, <laughs> and I appreciate you. Um, Ms. Mack, just to add to what you've already shared, and you and I have had many conversations because I know you're equally passionate about um, this. And so um, it is a multifaceted approach, as Dr. Montcombe has described. So we are, you're right, we are encouraged by having a much more systematic and explicit tier one for our primary grades to see the those numbers um, shrink in terms of the students who need specific intervention. What uh, Ms. Kraft mentioned briefly, but what cer certainly warrants further explanation exploration is we are also redoubling our efforts um, to provide specific interventions targeted for the needs of adolescent readers who are striving. And so she mentioned programs such as System 44 and Read 180. These are high quality evidence-based um, resources for intervention that we are um, putting in place and continuing to expand opportunities for students to have access to in the middle and high school grades to do exactly what you just described, which is really about accelerating learning. So the, the problem that you surfaced about um, students who are striving readers need to make more than a year's gain in a year's time if we're going to close that gap that you described. Um, and so we are being really intentional about identifying specific programs as well as continuing to provide training and professional learning for teachers in general education and special education so that we are coming at that from multiple perspectives. In terms of your question around retention, so I'm, I know you well know that we have a policy and rule that outlines the specifics about promotion and retention. And one of the things that I think is really important is that that rule 5200 does spell out that we can only consider retention once we have documented specific intervention strategies, which is why everything we're describing to you about our multi-tiered systems of support and all the number of contracts we've brought and professional learning we've brought is designed to make sure that we have done a really good job of effectively documenting those evidence-based interventions explicitly taught and systematically used so that that conversation can happen in alignment with what you said. There may be an instance where a child at some point in their elementary career should be retained, but not until we can sufficiently document and support that we have implemented these specific intervention strategies. So essentially everything we're describing is actually moving in the same direction you're talking about um, which has not been in place um, across the board in every grade level at the explicit and systematic way that Ms. Kraft just described. 
Ms. Shea, can I just address that real quick, please? Of um, thank you. I appreciate that information. And I, I guess what I'm seeing, I spend a lot of time in school this whole pandemic. I've had porch meetings and walking meetings with teachers. But I'm hearing from teachers that they do all of the tier support. They document it. They then say that this child is not ready because he or she does not have the basic foundation of reading to move to the next grade. And the principals say everybody has to pass. And I just think we need to take a look at that because, I mean, in my two years on the board, I have only identified two children who have been retained. And in both cases, the parents fought very hard for their children to be retained. I just think we need to look at it differently. Um, if a, you know, it's like building a house. If you don't have a strong foundation on your house, you can go ahead and put the walls up. But at some point when the wind blows, the walls are gonna shake. And I just, I, I think that's what we're doing to our students. And I think my time is up. But Thank you can you. answer. I just can't answer and ask any more questions. <laughs> So thank you, Ms. Mack, uh, for your, your comments. We, we hear and receive what you're saying. Um, and I, I um, just also quickly just want to touch on, I know we come back to the attendance conversation every meeting. Um, and again, I would just like to reiterate that it's really uh, incumbent upon every one of us to, um, to do reach out when we have students um, that are not attending or are struggling. Either way, they may be attending but not doing well or not attending. Uh, rather that's in virtual or in, in person, there's a whole um, series of outreach that occurs. And I know we've talked in previous meetings about some of those school structures that routinely operate to help with that. Um, is that perfect? Probably not, but it is enduring work. It's work that we constantly have to work at on that. So I know in the interest of time, we're, we're trying to make sure that we uh, monitor things, but I, I have confidence we'll come back and talk again about that. So thank you as always, thank Ms. You. Matt, Ms. Mack, for being a crusader for our children. Thank you very much. Of course. And next we have Ms. Pasture. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. McComas, Ms. Shea, Ms. Kraft. Um, truly, if I have faith in folks to spread the message correctly, it would be with the th among the three of you, with the three of you. Um, I know you know what you're saying. Um, and, and, and what I'd like to hear more of is what you said tonight in your comments, um, because it's not just the tiered supports, as you mentioned, uh, and also mentioning um, uh, developing the skills. And then you brought in, Ms. Shea, I think it was, brought in the culturally varied materials. Um, and the, then saying the examination of different learning needs. But what you all really were saying, what, which is what I want folks to hear all the time, is that they are not separate that you recognize, and we've got to make sure that our administrators, um, our teachers, all of us on the board, parents, understand that even um, as Ms. Mack was talking about, about retention, that we don't all um, mature, intellectually uh, mature, or in our skills at the same time. Um, and so all of those things are happening uh, together. Uh, just like things moving um, in that manner, that sometimes it is wonderful to have the culturally varied materials. Children need to see people who look like them, but we don't want them just to look at pictures, and we don't want them just to know that the writer was of this particular orientation, cultural orientation. We want them to read what's behind the pictures and read the names of those writers as well at the same time. So I, I would just um, like, and this is what I like about the idea of the compass, that we are now doing, and I always come back to that professional development, and I know you ladies know how to do that and make it stick, um, <laughs> that all of these things are happening all the time and together, and that our children, re and helping parents to understand so they don't go into crisis mode about where their children are 
all of the children are not going to be at the same spot at the third grade or at the fifth grade or at the 10th grade. They just aren't. But what is important that we all have that professional development that helps us to understand that. And from your office and the other offices where the specialists are, the people who go out are saying, let's take a look at what's going on. And that's why we have all of these materials that you're always bringing, because no one thing is ever going to be the panacea. And I appreciate um, what you all have said. I just um, want you to keep saying it, and I hear my bell ringing. So I'm going to stop, and I'm not even going to act like I'm asking another question. I'm just going to stop right there. But just keep saying it over and over and over until people get that we don't always get to a spot at the same time. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. McComas, if there was a, a question you wanted to answer or a response you wanted to make to Ms. Pester, you, you have that time to do that. Oh, thank you. I, I think, Ms. Pester, I didn't really hear a question. I think you were just affirming um, in your experience that uh, it is complex work and that it is not uh, children or learning to read is not mechanical. It's not like making widgets. Um, but it's true craftsmanship and it takes time and it's an individual journey with each child, rightly so. Mm -hmm. And we do need to do better. <laughs> thank and you. Next, thank you. Next we have Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Hi, Mr. Kuhn. Hi, good evening. And thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, just one note. Um, if you could make these presentations available on board docs before the meeting, it would be useful. Uh, it's a lot of information to cover, and I unfortunately can't go back and look at at the different slides that were just uh, just used to provide us all this great information. Yes, sir. So, um, I guess my first question is, you know, and and there's a lot to reading. I know it's layered, and I know that it's, you know, um, we we what, what do they say? We we teach to read until about third grade and from third grade on we we read to learn so it's extremely important and um i understand that we've we've changed the materials and the curriculum we use and we moved to open court and i believe letters and we moved away from uh balanced learning and, and other materials so th i think that's great um one of the questions i have is what is in place for evidence-based writing instruction yeah and I will ask Ms. Shea and Ms. Kraft to join in that conversation because that is an area, uh, Mr. Kuhn, that we are uh, working to strengthen. So thank you for identifying that. Yes, thank you. That's a, um, a great question, Mr. Kuhn, and it is an area of need. Um, we don't currently okay. have a specific intervention identified in the same way we have for reading. We have really um, had a very laser-like focus. There are some out there um, in Tier 3. We have begun. Um, I Now, again, my months are going to get confused from pandemic, so Ms. Kraft can interject. Um, I believe it was last uh, fall we initiated a request for information, which you know is the first step in looking um, to begin the process of having a contract for a tier three intervention for writing. Uh, we did that in collaboration with the Office of Special Education. Um, so right now, the explicit writing instruction is aligned to the standards-based curriculum and part of um, in the elementary schools, it is included in the Wonders Anthology resource that you saw reflected on that chart. And in the secondary, we do have our Collections Anthology, which does have within it explicit modules for the writing process and writer's workshop, as well as additional opportunities for students to engage in interactive writing opportunities across um, content um, using additional resources infused from nonfiction sources such as the History Channel and um, science journals. And in those interactive um, writing experiences, the writing modules, um, students do have an opportunity to get real-time feedback. Um, so there is definitely instructional resources that I would say are more aligned to that tier one, if you think about that multi-tiered system of support diagram that Ms. Craft shared. Um, but you really do want to identify um, an area of need, which is about those supplemental tier two and tier three supports um, for explicit writing instruction, which is an area of focus um, moving forward. Ms. Kraft, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. 
No, I think you were right on with the fact that we were uh, right before the pandemic hit, we had been working with the Office of Special Education in ESOL to look for um, some tiered writing interventions. But I did want to offer at the secondary level that reading apprenticeship, although I know reading is in the title, actually does reading, writing, talking, and reasoning. And so within that tier one instruction, reading apprenticeship is designed in each discipline to learn how to write like you would write as a scientist or to write like a historian. And so there are some, and that is, um, uh, rated by ESSA as having strong evidence. So it's at the highest level um, of evidence. Um, and so that is something we have in place for tier one. And um, we are going to put in place some tier two and tier three um, as soon as we are um, able to uh, pilot some things in school and things are back on track. And just to add to that really quickly, you may recall um, reading apprenticeship is, was part of what we use the Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant funds to provide for our middle and high school teachers, just to connect those dots. Thank right, you, Ms. Kraft. Thank you for that information. Um, it sounds like there's work to be done in the in the writing area. Always. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can get to some evidence-based um, uh, curriculum soon. Uh, so I've got some follow-on questions, and I know I need to move things along. Um, you know, we talk a lot about professional development, and I can't imagine a more important place where we need professional development than in teaching teachers and hiring and finding teachers that understand the science of teaching and how to correctly teach reading. So. I would like you, if you could, and I don't know if um, this is outside of CNI, but I would, I would think you'd be focused on it. What, what steps are we taking, and how is this priority playing out through the system? Right. So I will get us started, and then I'll invite um, Ms. Shea and Ms. Kraft to join. So first, absolutely, Mr. Kuhn, we could not agree with you more in that you know the need and the urgency to have uh, teachers enter the profession already truly skilled in a, a scientific foundation of, of reading instruction is really uh, evident. And, and again, I think uh, there's a great deal of work to be done at the university levels and teacher preparation uh, programs to actually create an, a, a workforce that is ready to, to hit the ground. Um, and I will uh, say that that is work that I, I think is happening um, at different paces at different universities. So to to balance that, we have offered um, extensive professional learning and continue to offer extensive professional learning for our teachers in the letters um, um, program that you'll often hear us refer to. And on that, I'll ask Ms. Shea or Ms. Kraft to kind of expand a little bit more on that um, program and the professional learning that goes with that. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Dr. McComas. So LETTERS is an acronym that stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. And we've been able to um, train nearly 2,000 teachers in the last several years through our partnership um, with special education. And that training consists of three full days, three modules, um, which is um, close to 20 hours of explicit professional learning that's really written at a graduate uh, course level um, that really begins with the science of learning to read. As um, Ms. Kraft talked about, it begins with brain research and the functional MRI imaging that helps us understand the neurodevelopment um, and the neurodiversity of learning to read and continues on through the spe sound spelling correspondences um, and the decoding and encoding required in spelling. Um, so that is something we initially offered. We started doing it a few years ago where we would offer cohorts um, multiple times a year. We're still doing it. We were even, we've shifted and are doing it in a virtual setting to ensure that we don't miss a beat because what we know is with um, teacher turnover, we have um, often every year we hire many new teachers in the primary grades. And so we continue to offer that. In addition, I just wanted to quickly mention, we do also work closely in partnership with our local universities. So we do have partnerships where we um, do meet periodically with staff, for example, from Goucher College and from Towson University um, to really expand on these needs. And I know um, staff and organizational effectiveness that helps us work on what certificate programs do we want to add for cohorts through um, organizational effectiveness. We have identified 
um, reading and the need for teachers to develop that additional expertise, both at the undergraduate level um, and then certainly at the graduate level. Um, and then last, I will say that this is also a statewide initiative talking about um, legislative initiatives about shifting the expectations required for teacher certification in the state of Maryland to require an increased level of expertise around reading. Um, because as Dr. McComas said, there's what we do in a reactive mode from the teachers that we um, hire to ensure that we have that explicit understanding. Um, but there are also efforts underway to try to um, improve the teacher preparation programs to better align to what we know is so critical for our students learning to read. Thank you, Ms. Shea. That's, that's a key point. And I think that um, at some level, and I would say that at hiring, we need to make it clear that we're not going to bring in teachers that don't understand this. Because 20 hours is what you mentioned, 20 hours of professional, that's a half a week of activity uh, from my measure. And I understand we can't do everything overnight, but um, working with these, uh, basically our providers, these universities that are turning out uh, teachers and they're the resource that we need. But we need them to understand this because this is critical to our success. I can't, Absolutely. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can like make that more apparent to everybody on this call. If there's one thing we do, we need teachers that know how to teach reading. You will get no argument from us, sir. <laughs> we, agree. We, we agree. We know teachers are the um, number one factor for student success and, and reading is it. That's, that's ground zero for it all. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Pierce. you very much. Ms. Rowe? Good evening, Dr. Thomas. Good evening. Um, so the question I have is, what is culturally proficient pedagogy and specifically, how is it different than traditional pedagogy besides incorporating culturally diverse instructional materials? Well, one of the, and I will, again, I'll get us started and I'll invite my team to join um, to make sure that we have a robust response for you. So I'll, I'll begin us by saying, it, it, first and foremost, it's, it's recognizing that the cultural nuances uh, that uh, students bring to the classroom um, are, are benefits to learning. And it's not that differences are disadvantages, but really differences add strength um, and quality to learning. So that is one sort of like a frame of mind to begin with. Um, and certainly layering in and bringing that frame of mind um, into the classroom day in and day out is ensuring that students have opportunities to read um, uh, about multiple perspectives, right? To, because most of us um, as young people and within our families grow up within a singular culture in our early lives. And as we grow older, we move deeper and deeper into um, uh, diversity, right? Rather that's in our school environment or our work environment. Um, and so it's helping students understand that differences are assets um, and not deficits, recognizing um, how to understand multiple perspectives through a variety of exposure to a variety of, of literature, a variety of, um, I know as a historian, it would not only just be literature, but it would it would also be media. It would also be uh, speeches. It could be a variety of formats. Uh, so that, that begins us down this road of cultural proficiency and understanding that education is not from a singular um, cultural perspective or a single narrative. And I, I would invite Ms. Shea and Ms. Kraft to, to join in um, on that. Absolutely. Once again, you did a great job. <laughs> um, I will add, and then I want to quickly turn to Ms. Kraft because I know this is an area of passion for her. Um, so in addition to um, Dr. McComas talked about specific areas of representation and multi multiple perspectives, um, instruction is culturally mediated, but it also incorporates and integrates diverse ways of knowing, understanding, and representing learning. And so it all takes place within that asset framed mindset um, to understand how the cultural and linguistic differences are viewed as assets and they need to understand students are taught specifically to understand that their cultural differences can be assets in terms of demonstrating their knowledge and so yes it is partly about as you mentioned Ms. Rowe definitely examining um, the resources that we're using but it's also about ensuring the relevance so that the context within which we are explicitly instructing our students the authentic literacy experiences that we referenced before are all situated 
created in an authentic culture reflective of the multiple perspectives and identities of our students. Um, and so with that, Ms. Kraft, I want to give you an opportunity to chime in because I know this is an area of particular passion for you. Yeah, I guess I would say when we're talking about culturally relevant pedagogy, that you're really drawing on that asset-based approach to instruction in which teachers affirm the identity of all students. And so within a culturally responsive um, classroom, all students' identities and experience are valued, and they're used as a bridge to the new learning. And so when you think about the fact that learning doesn't take place in a vacuum, but rather is influenced by both social and cultural context, the fact is that we have to make sure that we are not only recognizing, but valuing um, all of those different contexts that um, our students bring with them, and that we don't see um, different as negative, but that as that difference actually enriches our classroom and our experiences to live in a multilingual, um, diverse world. And so it's really important when we think about it is that what we're saying is that we're going to affirm the identity of all of our students so that they can learn and reach their full potential. And so I think that, I mean, I could go on for a while, but I'll just leave it there. <laughs> well, and what I thank you, Ms. Kopp. What I would also add is I think we'd be remiss if we didn't also understand underscore that um, culturally relevant pedagogy um, ensures the communication of high expectations for all students. Um, so it's truly living out the expectations realized in our equity policy and communicates clearly those high expectations for all students. So would, would it be accurate to say that um, a more collaborative style of classroom versus competitive aids in this Yes, so you raise a really good point, Ms. Rowe, because in um, the collectivist cultural approach in terms of collective success is a hallmark of um, many of our diverse cultures. So I think that that certainly can be an aspect of it in terms of um, less focus on one single right answer or the needs of an individual, but more of a collectivist approach. Uh, collectivist approach would certainly be um, indicative of someone framing it through a culturally relevant pedagogy, certainly. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. So um, I had some questions. Um, I wanted to uh, just unpack a little bit the current attendance procedures. And I'm just going to list a couple of questions and I'll let you um, respond. So I uh, want to understand how the current attendance practice at elementary school where if a student logs into um, any class, including a special during the day, that they are um, checked as in attendance for the day. Um, how does that align with the uh, state and MSDE requirements for daily instruction? Second, how is it effective to not understand which child has missed key instruction time, as you've been talking about, with literacy that needs to be made up? And um, how is it um, effective when a student could have lack of ma mastery that relates to missed instruction versus a student that is struggling um, but has attended um, almost all of the instruction, where that information would then lead the school system to decide to do an assessment, to do a specific intervention, um, the assessment for learning differences or learning disabilities. So. That's, that's the first round. <laughs> okay, um, I will go ahead and get started. So uh, your first uh, part was asking about our attendance and how it lines up with uh, state expectations on attendance. Did I get that? Did I understand your question correct, that first part? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. And I, I believe that we had sent um, a, a detailed um, explanation um, in a weekly update, but we are aligned with the MSDE ex uh, expectations. And so that is something that I can, per I don't have the MSDE guidelines right in front of me this evening, um, but that is something that we can work to provide you a more detailed uh, explanation on. Okay, because the, 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 the school system and the board need to provide information to the Maryland State Department of Education yeah. um, about attendance. So we certainly, as a board, want to make sure that that is accurate and in alignment with their expectations. Absolutely. So, uh, Ms. Causey, let me just respond, Dr. Williams. So 
This has been, um, thank you for those questions. You know, the, the state board is going to be working with each of the local school systems to look at the first term performance metrics. So in terms of um, the synchronous learning, in terms of the enrollment of students, their success, um, there are several points in which uh, we are working collaboratively with Dr. Salmon and Dr. Uh, Williamson, uh, Dr. Williamson is the deputy state superintendent. Um, we're going to look at all of those, but I want to go back to a comment that was made earlier. You know, the work of the school is still happening with the teacher, the student, and the families to triangulate and to look at how successful students are doing or not. Um, and whether the parent is raising concerns or whether the teacher is raising concerns and those interventions that are happening at the school level. Um, but right now, because of the pandemic, um, this, this, there, there hasn't been any strict rules or next steps other than what was shared earlier about how we're doing our attendance at the elementary, how we're doing our attendance at the, at the secondary. And if there are problems, that triangle of the student, the teacher, and the parent or guardian caregiver are collaborating to work through what are those signs? You know, our, our supports in the school buildings, our counselors, our social worker, our PPWs are still working uh, and collaborating with staff uh, or collaborating with families if they're if they're seeing a change, if they're seeing that the student is not engaged or the, or the student is not logging in, it, it is still that work at the local school level. Um, we are continuing to work with, our, with MSDE in terms of how we are progressing uh, during this first semester. And there are some next steps um, that I'm sure we'll constantly will have some updates um, regarding how we're reporting our, our success, uh, what's the learning. Um, but I, I really think as we worked, as I shared, the EDs and CECSs have weekly meetings with their principals and, and they provide updates. It's really that the work of our classroom teachers and what they're doing every day. And when they're seeing problems, uh, they're collaborating with the families as well as the school-based leaders. Thank you. So were my other questions going to be addressed related to um, children having missed instruction time that needs to be made up and um, the difference between students not demonstrating mastery and the difference between a student who has not been able to attend content versus students who have attended but have other reasons that they are struggling and need different interventions. Right. So thank you, Ms. Um, Kazi. I'll, I will work to answer both those questions. So, um, and thank you, Dr. Williams, for um, your contribution to uh, our questions as well. Um, so, Ms. Kazi, I think your first question is um, about students that may have missed time and how do we provide support to compensate for that time. And so that can be done in a number of ways. Um, as you, you know, uh, we are fortunate. We have... Um, um, funds uh, through COVID relief resources. The governor has uh, provided funds to support tutoring. So providing actual supplemental time for students to work on areas that they are struggling with is one strategy to help a student recover ground uh, that they may uh, be behind on. Um, in terms of um, students who are behind, if you will, because either uh, they have missed school for whatever reason may be, or um, it's they're, they're attending, but they are struggling. In, in both instances, what's really important is to understand what is the root cause of the struggle. Certainly if we have a child um, who is, is not attending, uh, we need to dig into the root cause of what that is. And I think Dr. Williams really just spoke to uh, the, the qualitative work that must happen to be able to help with that. Um, and likewise, as we were describing earlier, understanding what's the root cause of a child struggling with reading, it's important to understand, is it 
um, uh, a fluency issue? Is it a decoding issue? Is it a, a phonemic um, issue? And understanding uh, really where where in that pyramid of uh, response to intervention does the child um, fit, so to speak? What, what tier of intervention do we begin with? Um, and monitor the progress. And if that is not working, then we come back to the table and we look at what are the other resources. And some of those interventions can occur throughout the school day. Some can be provided in a tutorial, um, like a tutoring um, complement. It really does come down to that sort of customizing the intervention approach to help a student accelerate from where they are to where we, we would ideally like them to be. So I hope I provided um, some framework to help uh, a, answer that question. Um, thank you. I still have concerns, but I'll move along. Um, if students cannot read on grade level, um, it seems that to me, and please clarify, that it's also uh, harder for them to do math, which is more problem solving uh, verbiage oriented than it used to be. Is that correct? Well, certainly literacy is key to all the other subject areas, and I would include that with mathematics because, as you said, as, um, as the standards around mathematical practice have become um, more demanding in terms of literacy so that they can understand the, the context of a problem, be able to identify um, what is the key information within a problem, and then understand um, what formulas uh, to apply uh, to the context of that problem. You're right, their reading uh, capacity is very influential in uh, demonstrating their math uh, capacity. It's, it, it's no longer are we in the days where math is just computational skills. Just like with reading, we talk about decoding um, and fluency and, and ultimately want to weave those pieces together to be proficient in your comprehension so that those um, foundational skills are habitual and you don't have to spend your energy on that. You can spend it on more complex tasks. The same is true for math, right? So that your computational skills, um, ultimately, ideally, we want them to become habitual so that you're not spending so much of your cognitive energy on that, but you're able to apply your cognitive energy to more complex problem solving situations. Thank you for that. And my um, last question is, um, do we explicitly teach spelling in similar ways to the um, yes. uh, the uh, improved program that you have for liter for literacy. Yes, if, I'm sorry, Ms. McComas. <laughs> Dr. No, McComas, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, yes. So um, the sound spelling correspondences that we teach children to use to decode words are the same that we use to help them spell or what we call encode. Um, so that is explicitly taught through the open court curriculum. And then as we move into the intermediate grades, because English is actually morphophonemic, meaning that we spell by sound, but also by meaning because we get so many of our words from other languages, when we go beyond the explicit instruction and systematic instruction in decoding and encoding, we then dig into multisyllabic word with roots and prefixes and suffixes. So students have explicit instruction in what we call word study. Um, which is another pathway um, for um, vocabulary development and also spelling. Thank you. And sure. are there other board members with uh, questions or comments? Mr. Kuhn, I see your hand up again. Is that still relevant? I'm sorry, I thought I had taken it down. I could ask more questions, but we don't want to be here until 1.30 <laughs> again. That's correct. And we're uh, board members, thank you, we are. Uh, implementing our um, uh, efficient strategies. So thank you. Um, so board members, are, is there anything else before we uh, move from this agenda item? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, so we will move on then. Thank you very much for that robust discussion. Thank and you. We appreciate the opportunity. Yes, and then um, also the uh, presentations from tonight are going to be attached to board docs. The next item on the agenda is item K, the report, which is the update on water sampling. And for that, we call forward Mr. Dixit. Good evening, Chair Ms. Causey, Vice Chair Ms. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Pete Dixit. I'm Executive Director for Facilities Management 
And I have two of my team members with me today, Mr. Chris Roberts, uh, Director of Facilities Support Services, and under his team rests the Environmental Office. So we have David Glassman, who's the Supervisor of Environmental Services, with me here to make this presentation. Uh, we are presenting it to you today uh, an update on the progress of water sampling. Uh, the water sampling is for checking the lead level in water in compliance with 2018 Maryland regulations. We have already done a lot of work and made a presentation to you last year. The purpose of this presentation is to share the progress and for the benefit of some of the new board members, we have included introductory slides to show how we started and how we were supposed to complete it. And also included in tonight's presentation is the work that we have done in support of the motion that made the lead requirement even more stringent uh, than the state regulations require. So with this and a couple of other things, while all of this work is going on, every school has bottled water. And so uh, even those that have passed the testing have bottled water. So we have been extremely careful about the health of our students. With that introduction, I'll uh, pass this thing to Mr. Roberts for, for the conversation on this presentation. So Chris. Thank you very much, Mr. Dixit. If we could go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so Mr. Dixit hit on a lot of these uh, talking points in this slide regarding uh, the regulations. So quickly, um, our sampling is guided by Maryland State regulations from April of 2018. With that, all schools must be sampled every three years. So every potential drinking source in those schools must be sampled. Um, Mr. Dixit uh, also shared that uh, with that, we have provided bottled water to all schools that are covered by these regulations as a, uh, a preventative and proactive measure um, while we embarked on the sampling process. Uh, some potential sources of lead that exist um, we can start from our municipal supply from Baltimore City and that supply piping, uh, both of which must meet federal regulations. And then we come to our building piping and our dispensing fixtures, which are listed here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our sampling protocol is outlined here. Uh, our water sampling must be done during normal school operations. And again, all potential drinking sources must be sampled. So uh, our protocol includes flushing of the fixtures. That's the first step. Uh, then the water must sit idle in the pipes for anywhere between eight and 18 hours. After the minimum of eight, you know, in between the eight and 18 hours, we begin our sample collection, which is the first 250 milliliters of water out of the dispensing fixture after the water has uh, set for that minimum time. This is designed really as a worst case scenario under normal you know, building operations where the water have set, would have sat that long and then we take our sample. So the sample is then sent to a uh, state certified laboratory uh, and then we receive the results. Uh, next slide, please. So with the, the results, the, we have an extensive communication protocol. Our protocol was developed uh, in partnership with our Office of Communications and Community Outreach. So once we receive the results, all schools uh, send a notification home with all staff and students via their uh, typical communication process, which means uh, some schools uh, do that electronically via email and some via hard copy, and some may be a, a hybrid approach of both. But uh, all staff and students are notified of their school's individual results. And in addition to that, those results are also posted on the BCPS website for all schools. So that information is available to the public at any time 
for any school. Uh, next slide, please. So our actions taken to this point with our sampling is uh, any fixture with results that were above the action level were immediately turned off the day the results were received. Uh, the, and again, I should uh, start it back that the sampling, the initial sampling year was school year 2018-19, which has been completed. So any fixture that was uh, found to be above that action level was immediately turned off. All of those fixtures, which we've designated as failed, have since been replaced. Those replacement fixtures have then been resampled uh, prior to, which is protocol, prior to them being placed back in service. So the resampling process of the failed fixtures occurred uh, from October 2019 through February of this year. And all of that resampling data was received and is, is available to us now. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Glassman, who will get into uh, more of the details on that. And uh, you can advance to the next slide, please, David. So uh, stepping back uh, quickly to our, our initial sampling year, 95% uh, of the fixtures that we sampled were below the action level of 20 parts per billion. Um, there were uh, 380 fixtures that required um, replacement uh, as they were elevated above that action level. In addition to that, we identified uh, or through uh, maintenance, there were 346 additional fixtures that had been replaced during that year. Uh, anytime a fixture is replaced, it must be sampled under the regulations within 12 months of the replacement date. So uh, because of that, last year during that sampling period, uh, we sampled 727 different fixtures in 129 different schools. And of those uh, fixtures that we sampled, we still had, we had 152 of those that were um, above the action level uh, for, for um, different reasons, um, but our uh, response to those is to do a more extensive uh, Renov uh, a remediation of that of the fixture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in, in addition to uh, responding to the regulation, last year the board uh, has asked us to take uh, action on all fixtures that had uh, uh, exceeded the five parts per billion. So we went back and reviewed all of the data from the previous year. And, uh, and then took the data that we received last year. And um, we are taking action on those fixtures in the following ways. Uh, water fountains, uh, drinking fountains uh, are being turned off until uh, we, uh, we have uh, eliminated, until we, we decide that it's time to take bottled water out of the schools. Uh, our taps are being uh, identified as hand and dishwashing only. We were concerned about turning off. We have uh, over a thousand taps that that exceeded five parts per billion, and uh, we were concerned about turning that many taps off, especially in, in the in the uh, current situation where hand washing is so critical. And uh, uh, bubblers are being removed permanently, uh, and uh, from the from the buildings. The uh, Number of fixtures between five and 20, uh, we had 136 schools and just over 2,000 fixtures that we are taking action on. Um, it is uh, our plan to have all of these fixtures addressed before any students return to school. And uh, the four schools that are scheduled to reopen uh, uh, in the next few weeks uh, are all completed. Next slide, please. So uh, as as Chris noted, uh, we do we we are required uh, to uh, do our sampling while the school is occupied. So all of our sampling stopped last March when the built normal building operations ceased. Our uh, ongoing plan is to sample one third of the schools each year, uh, so that we can it, within a three year period all the schools will be sampled according to the regulation. But we can spread out the load. Uh, it's a more efficient way for us to do this. And uh, last year, we had completed 27 schools. 
before the uh, the shutdown. So we were about halfway through our, our plan. Um, all sampling will resume as soon as school returns to uh, to normal occupancy. And um, that, uh, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and turn it back to Mr. Dixit. So thank you very much, Chris and David. I, I must acknowledge that there was tremendous amount of work added uh, to our environmental office and uh, David and his team, small team, did an outstanding job to meet all the requirements under the regulation and pretty much most of it under the board's resolution until we had to stop uh, because of the COVID. And we'll continue to do our work. Uh, we are on the right path and we have had tremendous success. So with that, we are open for questions. We are all going to try to answer if you have any questions. And if we can't answer, we'll get back to you. Board members, are there, uh, is there discussion? So the first hand I see is Mr. Offerman, then Ms. Scott, then Dr. Hager, then Mr. Kuhn. Uh, I'd like to simply ask how we check the quality of the bottled water that, that we use. Thank you. David? Uh, we, uh, we get a report from our bottled water company regarding their test results. So um, uh, that's what we're required to do by the regulation. And that's what we're, we've been uh, provided from our, our water supplier on an annual basis. Mr. Offerman, if you're finished, we can move on to Ms. Scott. Hi, yes, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Dixit, uh, for your report and everybody who worked hard on um, providing us with um, the updated information about the lead test results. Um, I was just curious and I wanted to know, because as I was looking on the website at the update, there was still some that were quite high, um, like for instance, I saw Owings Mills High School. It looks like there's a land sink that's still 884 parts per billion. Another land sink that's 244 parts per billion. And um, I understand you said that, um, that the fixtures were replaced and that it was turned off so that no one was drinking or using that water. Um, but I wanted to know what steps you all would be taking if there was a larger issue as far as if it was not just a fixture, because I, I just wonder if it's still 884, is it not a fixture that may be the issue? It may it be something else? And what are you all doing to explore that? I'm going to try to answer that, and then maybe David can join me later on. So the first thing is that there is tremendous amount of variation we have found from fixture to fixture, and we really don't know why other than different fixtures are from different manufacturers that used different manufacturing processes. In order to manage that, we made sure that number one, that everybody had access to bottled water. Number two, as soon as we found, we immediately disabled that fixture. And uh, if, if it fails again after replacing, then the plan is to go take a deeper dive into the piping system and keep on going till we find the cause of it. So a sort of root cause analysis to do that. And so far, uh, we are hopeful that we'll eventually be able to find what is the cause of it, because we know the supply water coming meets all federal regulation. So it is somewhere from the main to our building, our pipe. And if most of the fixtures in the building pass the test and it's only one fixture or two fixture that fails, then it has to be either that fixture or the associated piping to that fixture. And that's the work that we'll do. David, if I missed anything, feel free to chime. Uh, I, I think you, you covered most of it. Um, yeah, I mean, just to, to be a little more specific, uh, once a fixture pat, if a fixture uh, fails a second time, if that location fails a second time, 
as Mr. Dixon said, we're going deeper. So we're replacing the lines that feed that fixture, we're replacing the fixture again, the lines that feed it, and we're going all the way back to the next valve. Mm -hmm. um, because those are the most likely sources. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and just my second question is just, again, because I was looking at Owings Mills and it looked like they had quite a few fixtures that were um, still elevated on the second go round. So um, uh, I was curious about that. And then I believe you answered it already where you said the, because there were some water fountains that were still above the 20 parts per billion, like at Northwest Academy, uh, looks like Lansdowne High School and um, at Battle Monument, you also said that that, that was um, taken care of, but I saw it looks like there's still a land sink that's at 199 parts per billion. So um, I guess I would say, what is your plan? Is there a timeline on, um, especially schools like Owings Mills, where Owings Mills High School, where, where they're still quite elevated levels? Well, the, the, we have, we've already addressed the, the fixtures. We've, uh, we've been working with our contracted services to, uh, to replace those fixtures and, and to enact our strategy. Um, where we, we're kind of stuck right now is we can't use those fixtures until we've resampled them. And we can't resample them until the schools return to normal use. So what, we really can't gather any information on whether, whether our strategy has been successful until we're able to get back in and, and do the sampling. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and Chairwoman Causey stepped away, so I'll be facilitating until she returns. Um, the next hand raised was Dr. Hager. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, and I actually love talking about water access in schools. It's one of the things that um, I'm also quite passionate about. Um, I want to follow up one, first on one of Ms. Scott's questions. Have, do you do you work with our public works departments to identify whether there is a community piping issue in the schools where you see consistent high levels of lead in the water source? Again, recognizing that we know the community overall water source is not contaminated like it was in Flint or something like that. Uh, we, we don't really work with, uh, we haven't had any conversations with uh, the uh, our public water source because they're, they publish their testing results on an annual basis. So uh, we have information about that's already provided to the public. So we're just yeah, utilizing yeah, I'm the just thinking approach. about the, the, the pipes in the community that, that are feeding into the school. You know what I mean? Right. Well, they're required to do, to do uh, sampling at the user end. Gotcha. So okay. they do sampling of their distribution system. They don't just sample the water at the, the at the pumping stations. They're, they're required to do sampling uh, throughout their distribution system and then publish that information. Okay, thank you. Um, so my other questions, uh, the first is, I, I probably imagine you have similar concerns about the amount of sitting water right now in the pipes in schools and just the concern that when we do go back to test, the levels might be artificially inflated because the schools aren't being used and haven't been since March. So do you have a plan in place for when, um, how to best test the water, how to best fl flush the system so that when uh, when folks do return to the buildings that, um, that the water is clean and usable? Well, we, um we have a flushing program protocol that we do at the end of every summer anyway, that we're, you know, so we, we, we were already aware of that. And that's something that the, actually the Maryland department of the environment has a flushing protocol for schools. We get a, we get a reminder email every August, but uh, we, we're already um, uh, aware of that. And we send that information out to our schools and we have already, uh, we've already, we've sent information out to our facilities, people in the schools, and we're ha having them flush now on a regular basis. We don't want to wait until a couple of days or a couple of weeks or even a month before school uh, starts. Uh, we want them to be flushing. And so we've given them a protocol to, uh, to flush their schools on a, uh, some, some areas on a daily basis, some areas on a weekly basis. And, and uh, so we're, uh, we're hopeful that we can stay ahead of it, um, not just from a lead perspective, but just in general, making sure that we don't uh, uh, have our chlorine levels drop um, and, and we have a disinfection uh, uh, issue. So yeah, we're on top of that. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. And we know that there are teachers and administrators in the buildings, in many of the buildings now. So 
Um, it's wonderful that you've already gotten started on that. Uh, I have two other questions. One is, um, have you ever included students in your in your water testing protocols? You mean having students do testing for us? Yeah, like clubs or science classes or anything like that. Well, one of the issues we have is that is that because our building has to sit for eight to eighteen hours, most, a lot of our buildings don't have eight hours of downtime, except for on the weekend. So we do all of our sampling at 7.30 on Saturday morning, you know, between 7.30 and noon on Saturday mornings. So we're, uh, um, we have not, we, and, and also uh, one of our protocol require, even though the, the regulation doesn't require, we require that all of our sample collectors are certified water samplers because we wanna make sure we have that level of expertise. Okay, thank you. And then my last question is, um, has the county considered installing water bottle filling stations in schools at any point? Like the filter, well, I can answer. You know. I know Mr. Dixon would probably answer it, but, but yes, that's actually, uh, we have been, I believe that's part of uh, some of the, um, the new, that are, that uh, uh, con uh, construction and, and improvement, that's part of what they're looking at in new schools and in uh, renovations is putting bottle filling stations. I know we have several schools that have them. Yeah, there's really great science around the uh, positive impact of, of those on kids' health. So that, that's wonderful. Okay. And that, those are all my questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, next, we have Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Oh, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, the first thing I'd like to to talk about is, and unfortunately, I, I, I'm not sure what slide this is on, but you were talking about going forward and continuing to sample, I believe, 30% a year. Is that accurate? Yes, oh. approximately one third of the total number of schools. Okay, so here's my question. Are, are you sampling one third and you're, you're sampling the entire school? That's yes. Correct. Yes. And how are you choosing those schools? Is it randomized, or because I would hope that you're doing it in all areas of the county? Uh, yeah, we 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 are um, spreading it out around the county. It's we're not we're not trying to do like one third in one area. No, it's it's uh, it's been spread out. So, is it randomized? I'm just curious as to how you're actually making these decisions so that we are indeed, you know, um, spreading well, it out. Well, what, what, we're, um, what we're trying to do is, is just, we have to sample each school once every three years. And uh, that's under the regulation. And so our idea, well, what our plan was is to divide, it, divide the schools into thirds so that we're sampling one third of the schools every year. Every school is still going to get sampled once every three years. Um, some of the schools were, were selected based on the number of fixtures that we had to sample anyway, um, either because of uh, elevated levels or because of the number of fixtures that had been replaced for maintenance. So that was an easy selection. Um, and then we just, uh, 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 it was one of my staff members who who was doing the uh, the selection, and okay, the you. only thing that we asked to, to do is make sure that we were you doing it from each of the the uh, the geographic areas to make sure we had coverage. Uh, one of the things we do when we sample is we try to do a cluster of schools in a day so that we can have a sampler who can who can go to multiple schools without having to travel a lot between because. Uh, when we do sampling on a Saturday, nobody can occupy that building until after we've sampled it. We are trying to limit our impact on the school usage on Saturdays. Um, so there, are, there will be groupings. It's not like we'll do you know, five schools spread around an area. We will do a grouping of, of a couple of schools each, for each sampling day, but we spread that out from week to week. All right, well, thanks for sharing that. So here's the concern. Based on what Ms. Scott uh, just asked uh, about the high levels of lead that have been found in the Northwest, I believe it's Owings Mills that she was pointing out and perhaps even Lansdowne, I would like to know 
that we are going to sample those schools every year. I don't want to wait three years to get back to that school that has an elevated problem until we realize, until there's zero problem, then we go into three-year cycle. So how are we going to approach that? So when a fixture is elevated, we can't turn that fixture back on until we have data that shows that it's no longer elevated. So when we say we're going to sample a, a third of the schools every year, um, that's above and beyond testing every fixture that was replaced since the last sample. Okay. So, for example, Owings Mills, if I've got 10 water fountains that are elevated, and probably the primary reason they're elevated is because we have bottled water in the school and we never use those water fountains. Um, that's one of the reasons that they may be elevated. But if that's the case that we have that those water fountains will not be in use, they will be turned off until such time as they we, we've been able to correct the issue. So that that those water fountains may get sampled every year until they they until we've uh, we've got data that demonstrates that they're um, um, no longer elevated. So yeah, those fixtures that are an issue will get sampled on as frequently as necessary. Okay, so if uh, so let me just ask a basic question. We have bottled water, right? So we're not using the fixtures. Is that degrading the fixtures and leading to, in essence, leaching of lead from from these fixtures somehow? And and are there fixtures that just don't have lead issues that we can just buy and be done with this? Um, well, s stagnation stagnation or lack of use of a fixture is known to increase leaching of lead from that fixture, even if that fixture is designated or, or has passed the standards to be qualified as a lead-free fixture. Um, because lead-free is just is, is a function of its uh, how it leaches uh, lead out of the brass. Um, there are some truly lead-free fixtures. Um, we haven't really approached that as a universal solution, but it may be a solution that, you know, like one of the things we're doing when we replace lines, uh, we're not, not replacing copper lines with copper lines, we're replacing them with plastic lines so that uh, we've eliminated that as a potential source. So we are looking at reducing um, our, our uh, potential for introducing lead into the system by using different uh, materials. And then one final question, um, and I'll let you go. Is there a point where we just stop replacing them and just go straight to bottled water and stay there? Well, actually, we do have. Um, I'm going to say we, we have a school that that we made that we made the the decision because of the um, the long term um, plans for the school, and we had a no the number of fixtures that were uh, elevated. We just uh, worked with the school, and um, you know we've uh, we're, we're not we're and had bottled water anyway. So we just made the decision that uh, we're not going to continue to sample everything in that school. Uh, that we're going to uh, use bottled water exclusively for drinking, except for a couple of fixtures that that we do need uh, for uh, like in the kitchen, and those are passing. Uh, they're below the five parts per billion. So um, we we have. We, it is it is an option that we're we uh, we're utilizing. All right, thank you for your thanks for your time. Great, thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Ms. Joes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Dixit, Mr. Glassman, um, for your presentation, um, and Mr. Robert, that was pretty good. Um, a lot of my questions were asked by my uh, colleagues. Um, I do want to emphasize that uh, last year. Our action level for lead per MDE is 20 parts per billion. And last year, this board um, unanimously passed a resolution to reduce that to, to five parts per billion because we all know that there's no level of lead that's considered safe for our children. I get this question a lot as to why we're pushing it because we do know that lead causes learning disabilities uh, in our children. So it's important that we provide them with safe, clean drinking water. 
Um, having said that, when I looked at the results, and I think I spoke this earlier, was it is sporadic, like Ms. Scott pointed out, there were some faucets that were not caught in January of 2019, and in the follow-up, you pick up X more uh, fixtures that now have led exceeding the allow or the allowable limit um, that we have. So, to me, that points to a, a bigger problem. Or, having worked with public utilities, I do know for a fact that the city of Baltimore or Baltimore County does not have any lead lines in its uh, service. It's mostly cast iron. So, how do you plan to address those? fixtures that have now exceeded the lead levels but did not previously. And I heard you just talk about a school where you will be um, continuing with bottled water for, is that a school that's being replaced? Um, While well, you made the decision, and thirdly, I'm going to cut in the budget, is that we spend about half a million dollars on bottled water a year. So is that actual bottled water which ends up in the landfill in the ocean, or is it just um, those refillable bottles that we're using? Um, because we're talking about, and Mr. Coons talked about this, about being, uh, you know, reducing waste and going towards strategic uh, sustainability. And, and the way we start that is by addressing uh, some of these issues that we are facing with, because I think in the world's most developed country, we should be able to provide safe drinking water to our children. So how how would you address this sporadic problem? Because I really would have liked to have seen this in a map displayed to see. It really is sporadic. There really is no rhyme or reason that I see looking at the numbers, but a picture always um, would have helped. And also want to thank Mr. Glassman, because I know the resolution we passed just increase the work that you have to do. So um, thank you for that. So let me try to answer some of the questions. Uh, before I answer any question, I do want to acknowledge all the help and guidance that Ms. Joes has provided to us since the inception of this program. So thank you very much. Our focus so far has been to make sure that we meet state regulation and also make sure that we meet the board's resolution as soon as we can. Now, some of the questions that we are talking about here about the type of bottle that we are using and the sustainability of that, we haven't gotten to that level, but we know that eventually we will. Once we take care of the first phase, we'll get into those things too. Frankly, we would like to, once, once the school passes, we would like to get rid of all of the bottled water, and sustainability is a very good incentive for us to do that. But we haven't gotten there, because there needs to be a conversation when we get to that point. And second piece was that, what do you do when repeatedly some, something is failing? And if that happens, it hasn't happened to that extent yet. If that happens, we just want to assure everybody here that we will not leave any step to make sure that we meet all the intent of the regulation and board's motion. There will be no condition where we allow any tap or any fixture to not comply with those regulations and leave it at the school. We'll turn it off, we'll take it out, we'll replace it, we'll do whatever we have to do to make sure that it has no impact on, 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 on safety of students. So that's about all we can say at this point that this is an ongoing thing. It's a continuous effort. So 2018 was the first time when there was an official regulation by a state or, or federal government about the drinking water and, and, and saying that you have to meet these standards. And our focus so far has been to make sure that we comply and keep safe supply for all our students. I hope I answered your question. You did. Um, so thank you for it. And I think earlier somebody had mentioned about if the utilities test um, the school. Uh, they don't. They're not required. But the new EPA rule that should be coming on in 2020, the lead and copper rule, will ask, will enforce or mandate utilities to test schools. At the end, right now, they only tested the treatment plant. So, um, wow, I hear the bell ringing for me. Thank oh, you. I, I did I did want to uh, 
answer your question about bottled water a little a little bit uh, more completely. Thank we you. use the five gallon uh, water bottles with dispensers. We don't use individual water bottles and those are returned to the supplier and they sanitize them, refill them. So uh, our water bottles are uh, reused for as long as they last. Thank you, Mr. Glassman. That could be something the board could address later on as we grow towards becoming a more sustainable uh, school system. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'll turn it back over to Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Hen. I did have a, a couple of questions, quick questions related to the water. Um, I too am very grateful that we are doing a much better job related to this. Um, the regulations from 2018 are helpful guidance. Um, earlier, you mentioned a school that um, you gave up, I don't know if that's the right term, you gave up uh, exchanging fixtures for bottled water. Which school was that? Uh, it's um, Bedford Elementary. And the main reason is that it was it's slated to be replaced. And um, we just, the school was not using any any of the fixtures for drinking anyway. Um, this was like, we had, we had a conversation with the principal who was very supportive of our choice. Okay, thank you. And then when you are um, looking at um, patterns or looking at issues in terms of what, what is the next cohort of schools that you're gonna do testing, um, do you use the age of the school Um, well, we just started this last year, so, and we only got through about half of the schools we were going to do. And, um, we were, the, the first thing that we looked at was, uh, we selected schools that had a, a significant number of fixtures that we were already going to sample based on the replacement sampling. So that was the first thing that we did, uh, because it just made a lot of sense to go ahead and if we're going to sample 50% of the fixtures, just we're going to be there that long. Let's sample all of them. So that would have been the first grouping that we we selected, and then based on that, we looked at the areas where those had been, and then we, you know, in a, in an attempt to be uh, uh, equitable to the to the different areas, we we selected schools in other areas to to sample. So we actually the the schools that had probably the biggest the biggest concerns were some of the ones that we resampled uh, full, fully again. Okay, thank you. I just realized my I was muted. Um, the next issue is uh, along the lines of Dr. Hager and Ms. Joes um, in terms of a map, seeing if these affected schools are in um, communities where there may be more um, action needed. Um, so is that something that is going to be evaluated? Ms. Kelsey, I think, I'm sorry, Mr. Dickinson. I think we can um, work and discuss that as a team. I don't know um, how detailed that can be, but I think that's a follow-up for the team. Okay, thank you. And again, I'm just grateful for uh, all of the progress that's been made. Um, it's been um, a, a big issue when I originally was on the board in 2015 visiting Lansdowne High School and Delaney High School and others. Um, so it's, we appreciate it. Other board members before we move on to the next agenda item? Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. And we will move on to the next agenda item. Thank you very much. Certainly. And we are moving on to item L, a report on the uh, update on reopening of schools. And so for that, we will call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, everyone. Uh, we have members of our design team um, here this evening to provide a, an update to the board 
um, several questions um, that surfaced from the last meeting. Uh, so we have Dr. Brian Scriven, Dr. Mary McComas, Dr. George Roberts, and Mr. Burke at this time. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I'm Billy Burke, the Chief of Organizational Effectiveness, and I'll start our reopening update with uh, some information about the COVID relief grants. Uh, Mr. Corns, could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so right now we're operating under quite a few COVID relief grants. I'll speak briefly about uh, what they are. Uh, there's the CARES Act grant, the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund, which is called the ESSER grant. The Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, Fund, which is called the GEAR grant. The Reopening Schools Incentive Grant. The Coronavirus Relief Fund Technology Grant. The Coronavirus Relief Fund Tutoring Grant. And then finally, the Broadband for Unserved Students Grant. And as you can see from the information on the slide, I tried to provide um, information that would show you the primary places where we are making expenditures using those grant funds. And so they fall under food and nutrition services, curriculum writing and professional learning to support virtual instruction, and the student curriculum materials. That would be the supplies and the distribution. The same for technology, we've uh, certainly been purchasing Chromebooks, headsets, cameras, hotspots, and internet service. Again, that is uh, supplies and distribution. Uh, in the re-engagement and tutoring grant, uh, we spent most of the money on stipends uh, for teachers to work with students that were not engaged during the continuity of learning and who required additional uh, engagement opportunities as well as students who we knew uh, could benefit from tutoring support, and that um, grant is still active and working through December. Um, through those grants, we've also been able to buy professional, I'm sorry, personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, and uh, we've been uh, looking at the reorganization of health suites in order to make it possible to have the spacing available uh, if a staff member or a student is sick and the nurse needs to place students in isolation. Um, those are the main uh, expenditures on that grant. We didn't, uh, we wanted to give you a brief update on just the grants, what they are and how they're being spent. And we can move on to the next slide, please. So good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Dr. Williams and members of the board. Just wanted to give you an update on devices and I know we had uh, sent a communication to the board and uh, there was a request for a little more specificity around uh, the distribution of the devices. Uh, so I wanna give that uh, succinct detail at this time. From October 16th through the 22nd, uh, we have distributed 3,500 Chromebooks and 600 PCs uh, to, an, to address new enrollment uh, to the system. In addition, in this same time frame, uh, we have uh, distributed 1,800 uh, PCs as part of our swap model uh, for devices that have uh, been broke or damaged where uh, at the high school level, they're able to contact their uh, school and exchange the broke device and receive a new and refreshed device. We are looking uh, between November 6th and November 9th uh, to uh, deliver approximately 3,500 uh, devices uh, to schools uh, at the uh, pre-K level. And we will also start to deliver devices 
uh, to uh, paraeducators and our AAs, our adult assistants, uh, during this same window. And then we're going to keep uh, approximately uh, 8,000 to 9,000 devices uh, at our distribution site, which we will continue to swap out to schools on an ongoing uh, basis as we monitor uh, the number of devices that they are giving out. Uh, so I am happy to say that our uh, device, device situation is a lot more positive than the last time that I reported out because at that time uh, we were right on the verge of, of running out. So uh, we will be able to continue to meet the need of enrollment, uh, continue to meet student needs as devices uh, need to be swapped, uh, meet the needs of our uh, faculty and staff who need the device support such as paraeducators and adult assistants, and also meet the need of our pre-K students. Uh, with that, I will turn uh, the presentation over to Dr. McComas, who will uh, give the overview for textbooks and athletics. Dr. Yes, thank you, Dr. Scrivens. Thank you. Um, yes, and so textbooks, I just want to follow up. I know that there had been inquiries uh, around specific um, consumables and, and text copies. Um, and then we provide that uh, detailed um, follow up um, to the board. Um, and just um, for um, the good of stakeholders, um, we do have the majority of our resources are uh, offered um, digitally or for that suit the virtual format. If you find that you need a specific uh, hard copy of something, um, first thing that we do is ask that you reach out to the teacher, um, followed by the school administration. If um, the teacher needs support, school administration is always welcome uh, to reach out directly to our content offices and we will work um, to um, look into our inventory across the system to see where we can find a, a hard copy to make available for families or students as needed. Um, and so we'll just continue to reiterate uh, what our process is. Um, I do understand that people have learning preferences where they may prefer a hard copy or traditional text uh, compared to a digital copy. And uh, we'll continue to work in that manner uh, to support those learning needs while we're in virtual uh, format and as we move towards a hybrid uh, format. Um, in general, we have worked over the last several years to create a blended environment whereby we have resources that are available both um, in digital format and text um, uh, traditional hard copy um, to address differentiation and learning styles. And we'll continue uh, in that manner. Um, and I guess lastly, um, as I shared um, in previous meetings, more and more what is becoming the industry standard uh, relate the textbooks is for materials to be offered by the companies um, with a where there's a hard uh, copy they also um, it's it's rare these days to find them not also offer a digital version as well so um, we'll continue to work through specific requests and support if this needed um, and then athletics, um, I know we have uh, many board members and families and students who are excited about um, our athletics update today. I believe um, public information was shared this afternoon. Uh, there's two parts to our athletics update. I'll start with the fall. So this, you know, we have been on this journey of a two semester model. The fall semester has been a virtual coaching model um, with the second semester being the competitive seasons condensed. Um, our fall virtual model will now um, also have a complimentary in-person conditioning component. Uh, it is completely voluntary on behalf of students um, to participate or not. Uh, the information is presently posted and was posted this afternoon on our BCPS website and it's our athletics um, re-engagement program uh, that discusses um, that opportunity in more detail uh, for our students who are interested in that opportunity. I know many are and have been anxiously um, awaiting the opportunity. 
Our second part of our update on athletics, um, for those of you who have been following, and I shared with you um, just two weeks ago in our last board meeting update, that we um, were one of 22 uh, local school systems that supported the MPSSAA's recommendation to accelerate the competitive season and to have it begin in December. Uh, yesterday, I'm pleased to share that the Maryland State Board of Education did vote to support that recommendation. And so we will be beginning our um, competitive season seasons uh, semester starting uh, December 7th. And uh, just so that everyone's aware, the order of the seasons will um, be uh, the uh, winter season followed by the fall season in the middle and with the spring season in the end. If you uh, I want to make sure I give the right, yeah, that was the right sequence. So I just, um, again, that information is on our website. So I know there's many uh, student athletes and families and parents who are very excited to see that opportunity get up and moving and to see the competition seasons begin sooner. So thank you. And that really concludes the update on my two portions. And at this point, I will um, transition over to Dr. Roberts, who will begin talking to us about um, phase one of our, our holistic transition to hybrid learning. Great. Thank you, Dr. Fosman. So good evening, board members, Dr. Williams. Um, I shared with our community at the end of the September and per the governor and state superintendent, um, school systems must was school systems uh, needed to begin to bring back groups of students in a safe and healthy manner, beginning with students who are in most need. So the first phase of BCPS's transition to hybrid instruction identified our four public day schools as returning on November 2nd for staff and students returning on Monday, November 16th. I shared with the board, our public separate day school staff and multiple stakeholder groups earlier this week, a detailed plan of transition to hybrid instruction for our four public separate day schools um, is was occurred and is undergoing a final review and integration of feedback prior to sharing publicly with the community later this week. We, along with the school's leadership, are excited to welcome back students and staff in the upcoming weeks. However, as we welcome back students and staff to our public separate day schools, planning continues in the development for the next phase of additional small groups of students to include outside general educational, regional, and school-based elementary, middle, and high school programs, as well as our youngest learners and small number of students in specific CTE programs who require the use of specific CTE program equipment. So lastly, as outlined in our MSDE approved BCPS reopening plan by the end of the first semester, and if safety measures continue to allow, these additional small groups of students are scheduled to have the option to return to hybrid instruction. So that does conclude our overall presentation on update on reopening. I'm more available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I see Ms. Scott and Ms. Pasture thus far. Ms. Scott, you may begin. Oh, I apologize. Um, my hand was up from before. Okay, then Ms. Pasture. Thank you. I want to ask a few questions about the opening of the public separate day schools. Uh, I want to know. Uh, considering they really are, as some of our speakers asserted, um, our very vulnerable students. So I'd like to hear what the plan is, um, what the strategies are, uh, how our students are going to be even more protected than they are when we don't have uh, a virus, and what uh, we are going to do to support and safeguard our, our teachers, understanding uh, that many of our students can't wear masks, um, have some very special needs. So can you please outline what safety guidelines, health and safety guidelines will be in place to safeguard all concerned? Yes, so thank you for that, Ms. Pasteur. I certainly, what I can do is provide an overview, uh, just a brief overview of the plan, Ms. Pasteur, and then certainly um, for health metric questions, um, lean on Ms. Somerville um, for some specific health metrics um, that we're moving forward with for our four public separate day schools. So the overall plan 
um, really is divided into three parts. Uh, part one is a health and safety component. Um, and that part of the plan, that part one of the plan has six components to it. It um, outlines health metrics. It outlines mitigation strategies, screening, PPE strategies, uh, ventilation, and health services protocols. Part two of the plan goes into specifics around school operations. So there's six components for our school operations, there, which address parent drop-off and pickup, transportation, food and nutrition, determining a hybrid of virtual instruction. And that really speaks to how principals, when communicating and speaking to parents, um, will outline for a parent so a parent can make a decision whether their child would participate in a hybrid or remain in a virtual instruction, 100% virtual instruction. Then that part of the plan also goes into attendance procedures for, um, in the hybrid instruction, and then visitors to schools. How would schools in the, how would the four schools work with visitors who may randomly show up or visitors who have scheduled appointments? And the last part of the plan, part three, really dives into the instructional model. This area of the plan, Ms. Pesher, has five components. So it talks about cohorting and class assignments. So once parents do make the decision as to whether or not they're going to, if they choose to send their child and participate in a hybrid environment, well then that on this particular part of the plan will unpack uh, the cohorting. How will a child be cohorted? What will be their class assignment? If a cohort were to need to be changed for any reason, specific steps for how that would happen and how Prince gives guidance to principals on how the cohorting um, would occur. School scheduling, um, so provides some, some guidance for principals and for the staff on how the schedule would be built. Substitutes, um, so how some a little bit of guidance on staffing substitutes and how that would work in, in our four public separate day schools. Use of device, but specifically assistive technology, because we know there is a large use of assistive technology in our four public separate day schools. And then classroom layout. Um, we know that in our four public separate day schools, on average, we could have up to seven to eight students in a normal environment, in a non-COVID environment. So based on the number of students, um, we know in a cohort model, if we know half would come on an A day or A, half would be in a B cohort, that automatically takes us down to about three to four. And then based on the number of parents who obviously choose to send their students to, to participate in the hybrid environment, we could have even fewer number of students uh, related to the poor public separate day school. So I wanted to, to end um, with that question, Ms. Pastor was saying that the plan um, that was presented to the staff and, and to the stakeholders um, earlier this week was um, presented to and worked with our Baltimore County Department of Health. Um, so really, when we talk about health metrics and we talk about guidance and PPE, this was really done hand in glove with our Baltimore County Department of Health. So the, so the most current science and the most current um, information is included in this plan. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Roberts. And I can certainly appreciate the, the relationship with um, the health department and all of those things that go to that. But uh, I'm, I'm really taken by the fact that some of this has not been done, and this is to begin on November the 6th, I believe you said. For students. And is, I'm sorry, what'd you say? For students. For students, yes. So we're talking essentially two weeks, give or take a few days. And yet we still have to find out how many parents are interested in bringing back their children, which then is going to impact who will be teaching them um, because you want to make sure those numbers all work together. You want to have enough staff to work with the children who are coming back. And um, then you would have to find those trained subs, not just any sub, because these are children that have special needs that uh, staffing must um, take care of during the course of the day. So tell me, um, if you can, what that timeline is, where we are with this, because I'm hearing from parents, and I'm just pretty much right now dealing with parents um, who are concerned. And uh, so I really would like to know what the timeline is in making, finding out who wants to bring the their children back, um, and then next, 
how you reach out to the staff to know by school uh, that you have enough people because you could well have one school that is very much understaffed and another one that has better staffing. So what's the timeline that goes with this? Yes, yeah, so so thank you for that, Ms. Pesher. So a couple of uh, points here. So let's start with, with the staff and the parents. So a, a few weeks ago, um, a survey was issued to the staff, and that was part of, of the information that was shared um, with the stakeholders and the staff yesterday. So we know on average, and, and I don't have the specifics right in front of me, Ms. Pasteur, but on average, we're looking between the four schools or anywhere from 60, in between 60 to 65 percent of staff who indicated a few weeks ago that they were um, willing to come back to school. Um, and then uh, then the, another percentage of those who did respond saying that they could potentially seek um, potentially seek some leave option. Um, but we know now with the release of the plan and with staff coming back um, on the second, that if a staff member were to seek leave options because students don't return for another two and a half weeks, then that does would give that cushion of time. So we're talking about a timeline. So with staff returning, all staff returning on the second, if there were staff who were um, availing themselves or granted uh, various leave uh, or leave or um, we're not able to return for any other reason unrelated to COVID, then that would give time for the principal to schedule and reschedule um, based on the number of students, which I'll transition to with students. So starting today um, and continuing, and, and keep in mind, these schools have anywhere from about 80 to 120 students. I think we had a stakeholder mention Ridge Ruxin is our largest public separate day school, with about 120 students, um, all the way down to about 80. Or to 85. So the advantage to a small number, and this really speaks to, to the leadership of our principals in so many ways of, of these four schools, um, what we shared with the community yesterday and then the stakeholders was they wanted to call the parents. So what started today and what will continue tomorrow and conclude, if not tomorrow, by Thursday, is the school leadership is calling every one of the parents. So we received the potential, the initial parent response back. But again, because that was a few weeks ago, what will happen is to confirm to your point how many are coming back because the principal needs to know. And in order for them to know what they can take advantage of in this small setting is they're going to call each one of their parents and they're going to say, hey, Mrs. Pasture, good to talk with you. Let's talk about a little bit about some of the questions you have and, and provide a decision ultimately by the end of the week, because we know when we look at part two of the plan school operations, then transportation would have to be involved. Um, so the principals would then have to relay that information to transportation so we can build out um, a transportation schedule and give them enough time for pickup of the children and to build a schedule. So um, that's the timeline. Those are the things that have been occurring, things that are occurring right now, and ultimately the timeline for determining the number of, of students who would be coming back. So then the principals, once they have all that information, the, 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 the staff and the children, they can then build that schedule out for when students return in about two and a half weeks. So I know that the health suites are being looked at to uh, make any necessary uh, adjustments. So mm -hmm. in this period of time, then whatever necessary structural changes or any kinds of physical plant changes that need to be made to accommodate the most safe environment for them will also be done because you also want that to be commensurate mm -hmm. with the number of children and, and staff coming back That's or correct. what things have already been done. So, so it, I'm sorry, George, let me let me jump in and take that one if you don't mind. So, thank you, Pastor. Good, good evening, ma'am. Um, in evening. response to that, facilities has uh, worked hand in hand with the principals and done a walkthrough of those buildings. Uh, for instance, as it relates to uh, the nurse nursing uh, suites. It was determined that uh, separate isolation rooms were needed for each one of those schoolhouses. That's just one exam example. So those rooms have already been uh, identified and, and are already set up uh, to meet the need uh, once uh, students return on November 16th. So uh, we took a process 
uh, with the schools uh, that we do, similar uh, to onboarding new schools, uh, where we had wraparound services uh, for the principals to make sure that any of their concerns, we had the appropriate staff available uh, to meet those concerns and again, work with the principals to make sure uh, that uh, things would be in place prior to the reopening. Uh, so uh, that's where we are, just not with respect to, uh, to the nurses suites, but just holistically uh, in respect to uh, the school. Okay, uh, and and I, I really respect and appreciate all that, uh, but I just always pick up on words like determine and identify, which means that it has not happened. So it just seems to me that there are a lot of things that have to happen. I'm in, in a short period of time, and because right. I not only feel um, the, the importance of, of what's about to happen for these young people and also feel for their parents, um, who I'm sure many of them want to get their students back in as well, and for the staff, um, I, I just really want to, I, I just need to feel it, and, and I'm responsible. Uh, I mean, the largest one is in my district, so on, on that note, uh, I'm, I'm embracing this. I, I just want to feel that it's not just a walkthrough for all of this, that things in place, parents get the real sense, and that we're not rushing to the finish line with these young people. I want to see some young people in, and certainly uh, those who were probably behind before the pandemic and who might well be behind. I, I just have to have that feeling that we've done everything possible beyond thinking through it. And you've certainly done that, and I commend you for it. Uh, I'm just looking at the time. But I'm going to stop now um, just so I can hear if anyone else has any other questions that I might have missed or concerned. Maybe I'm the only one who's feeling this is like, like this. This is Causey. This is Rod McMillian. I have another question. Mr. McMillian, please go ahead. Okay, I want. I've got a couple questions on a couple different topics. So I'm going to start with athletics. I was informed this morning that there's a lot of seniors that front loaded their schedule in the fall semester. So how would that affect their participation in the spring if they don't have any classes or they have, back in the day, you needed two classes to participate. Suppose they don't have any classes or one class. How does that affect their participation? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question, Mr. McMillian. We'll have to work with schools. Um, through that because we know that the shift in the schedule was something that was made uh, really to be responsive to our context. So that's something that um, we'll have to uh, work together um, with schools and students to uh, work through that process. So thank you. And can you answer, is that a, the two, back in the day when I was the athletic director, there you needed two classes. Now, is, was that a county directive or is that a state directive? I'm going to ask Dr. Adams to um, add to the conversation. I think he'll be able to address that more specifically, Mr. McMillian. I'm sorry, I, I don't have that right in front of me. Hi, um, good evening, Mr. McMill Mr. McMillian, Dr. Williams, and board members. Um, it is a, uh, Mr. McMillian, I can't give you the exact number but it is a um, MSDE requirement that students be enrolled in and attending school if they are to participate in athletics. Okay, okay. so if a kid front-loaded his schedule for the fall based upon recommendations that we made, now he doesn't have the two classes required in the spring, are we gonna tell him that he can't play because we encouraged him to front-load that schedule? No, sir. Um, we have um, identified um, the Office of Athletics, uh, worked with the secondary executive directors of schools, and identified 
um, that this was a concern and something that we needed to address, and we are working through that as a system to provide guidance and support to students and schools about how to make an adjustment. So if it is a state requirement that they have two classes, are we appealing to the state to waiver that? There are no planned appeals at this time that I could speak of, Mr. McMillian. The state is also not um, given any um, indication that they would be accepting any of or providing any of the waivers such that they did in the spring. Okay. I'm going to ask as well uh, if Mr. Sai, I'm sorry, Mr. McMillian, I just wanted to make sure that we give Mr. Sai an opportunity to also uh, provide any clarification. So, Mr. Sai. If you could add to the conversation, that would be great. Yes, good evening. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, so, right to answer your question, we've been working in conjunction with um, the guidance office. And again, it is a state uh, requirement in Comar that students must be enrolled in attending. So what we have decided is that we should um, have the student athletes work with their guidance counselors and again, if they front loaded their schedule, they have to be enrolled in attending, but we're not, there is no number in terms of the number of classes that they need to take. So we're, we're kind of putting it back on the guidance department to work with the student athlete to, to determine what type of classes could either raise their GPA, help them out to get into college or whatever the, you know, that they could actually do to have them meet the requirement of enrolled in attending to continue to play sports in the second semester. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. No problem. Now, Dr. McComas, I have another question. Does this... Yes, sir. What applies to athletics, does it also apply to theater, band, course, clubs, and et cetera? Yeah, well, you know, thank you for that. Um, we're going to take this one step at a time, Mr. McMillian, and I know that everyone is excited to get everything moving as quickly as possible, uh, but we do need to take things one step at a time. Um, presently speaking, a vast majority of things are being offered to the fullest extent we can in virtual. Um, so I'm not saying that we aren't moving in that direction, but as of right now, we're working through the athletics implementation. So thank you, and I will keep you posted. Okay, and now for Dr. Roberts, can you explain to our listening public what does separate public day schools mean, imply, signify, or whatever? Oh, okay, certainly, and, and I have Mrs. Lichter on, on the call as well, our, second, our elementary executive director who supervises, directly supervises our public separate day schools. So um, in short, um, Mr. McMillan, our public separate day schools are four schools. So let's talk about three of them. So Maiden Choice, Ridge Ruxton, and Battle Monument that serve um, all IEP students, all special education students who range from um, whose, whose disabilities could range from emotional, range from physical, um, um, educational that through the IEP process are placed in one of the three schools based on the geographic area. So Maiden Choice serves our west side, uh, Ridge Ruxton serves our central area, and Battle Monument serves our east side. Um, and those students um, can enter um, anywhere from two years old all the way up through and stay through 21 years old. Um, so many of our students in the schools, in, in those three schools, will um, oftentimes stay for 5, 10, 15 years, in some cases from 2 to 21. So that connection, that bond is, is, is very, very strong, and the numbers are small. Um, they are staffed by not only special educators, certified teachers, but adult assistants, instructional assistants, um, uh, occupational therapists, speech therapists. So uh, um, a whole battery of related services to support the students and meet their IP needs and meet their educational needs, where White Oak is, an, uh, is serves uh, elementary students, more focused more on emotional, uh, social emotional learning, and those students ultimately transition to um, a, their home middle school. So those, that's really a broad overview, Mr. McMillian. Um, Mrs. Lichter, is there anything you wanted to add to that with respect to those four schools? The only other thing is students with individualized education programs, um, part of what's indicated on those programs is the level of service and the amount of hours of special education services they receive. So it's called their LRE, the least restrictive environment. Um, students in our four public separate day schools, their whole day is um, all special education services. 
there are no um, students with, um, there's no um, typically developing peers in those schools. So it is the most um, restrictive environment that we have because it doesn't have any access to the general education um, student in those buildings. The difference, so the buildings are all for students with special needs. Um, it would be the level before a non-public where students would leave the county, but it's based on the services they need. So it's providing, like Dr. Roberts said, the most intensive services. Um, but that's why it's a separate piece. It is a school for all students with special needs, where a lot of our other students with special needs are within our general education buildings or comprehensive schools. So they have the ability to be integrated with um, their typically developing peers as well. Okay, so if we break down separate public day schools, we've got separate from the general public, mm -hmm. from the general education uh, schools, we've right. got public versus private, and then we've got right. day versus residential. Correct, you got it. Okay, now, now I'm gonna switch gears again here. Uh, we've given those parents the opportunity, we've surveyed them, and we've given them the opportunity to choose whether they wanna come into that school building or whether they wanna be uh, uh, continue being uh, a virtual learner, correct? Correct. Okay, have we given the teachers that same choice? No, teachers are reporting. Uh, all staff are expected to report on the second. Okay, so teachers are expected to report, and their only other option is if they, if they are scared of their life for going into that classroom for whatever reason, the only other choice they have is to request a leave. They need to speak with human resources, right? So the guidance they've been given is if they have any questions regarding um, returning to work that they reach out to um, our benefits office and human resources. Okay, so if they can't, let's let's just suppose financially they can't afford to take a leave. And and so that, a leave is a, not an option for them. So then they, they have, if they wanna continue working for Baltimore County Public Schools, then they have to go into that school building with, correct? Right there, Mr. McMillan. See, I, I can't go down that hypothetical with you, Mr. McMillan, because all of those are, are case by case. So again, our guidance has been clear from the beginning that if, if staff have questions, then they need to talk with the experts in, in human resources around options um, and what they could potentially avail themselves of. Okay, and I just want to be, I just want to understand this. So. It appears to me that their only options are they either report to work or they pursue a leave through HR. That's the guidance that we've been providing to them, correct? Okay. Or have Thank the discussion with HR. Absolutely, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I'm finished, Ms. Coffey. Okay, next is Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation, everyone. Um, Dr. Roberts, would you mind navigating to your last slide? Uh, I don't control, but we can ask Mr. Corns. Could we revisit that? Okay. Thank you. So you, you had mentioned um, beyond phase one and the return of the public separate day schools, some other groups that were returning. Is, do we have those in writing? Is that something that can be provided to the board? Um, uh, well, with those details and a time frame. So I can work through Dr. Williams on that request, Ms. Hen. So you had mentioned those groups. Is that not available in writing at this point? So those were. So if, back in a September notification, um, those um, specifically to those groups were identified um, in a communication. Um, I want to say in mid to late September, but I, we'd have to go back and look. Okay, I, I was trying to take notes since they aren't on the slide. Um, would you mind repeating those? I did. I, I didn't mention those specifically. I mentioned the um, outside general education, regional, and school-based elementary, middle, and high school programs, um, and then I went on to CTE, um, youngest learners, um, and CTE programs that require specific CTE program equipment to meet their hours. So those were the extent of my comments, Ms. Hen. Okay, and and is there a time frame associated with those groups returning? You had mentioned. Right, so what I shared was by the end of the first semester, safety measures continue to allow those additional small groups of students um, are to be scheduled for the option to return to a hybrid instruction based on the approved, MS, based on our BCPS approved MSDA, MSDE plan. 
by the end of the first semester. That's what, that's what's in our current plan that was approved by the state. Okay. And would you mind defining youngest learners? What what grades would those be? Youngest learner. Two? Yep. yep. The youngest learners would be our youngest learners, correct? So those could be our pre our preschool, our three fours, our preschool um, kindergartners. So don't have the specifics now, but you those could be considered our young our and our youngest learners. Okay. And and at what point will the board receive a more detailed plan with some of those specifics? So at that point, we don't we don't have specific information. I don't have specific information at this point at this time to give you a specific timeline. Again, I, I that's why I wanted to to be specific in what has been approved um, and presented to the board and approved by the state department in terms of that option for or not the option the option to return to hybrid instruction by the end of the first semester. Miss Sand, this is Dr. Williams. We are working with our design team. Um, as we move through these phases and working with the design team that consists of um, our, some of our stakeholders, uh, we should be able to uh, provide how we are thinking about phasing in, like Mr. Dr. Roberts said, about these other groups of students. So um, we will definitely make public um, the plans for the uh, for public day schools uh, that speaks to the health metrics and the mitigation strategies. And then we'll work through the phase two of looking at bringing back additional small groups, still watching the metrics, still watching the positivity rate. And of course, definitely working with our stakeholders um, and our unions to uh, finalize these plans. Okay, so thank you for that information. And I'll just again reiterate the comments I made in our, our last meeting. You know, in the absence of information, the the public is, is losing confidence in our plans and that we have those plans coming. They want to see those plans. They want to see even if those timeframes could change, they, they want to see something in progress. And it's very hard to keep saying they're coming, it's coming, it's coming, and not have anything to show. So while it's great we're moving forward with some return to in-person instruction, um, perhaps, that that doesn't bring that peace of mind or that confidence to the rest of our stakeholders who want to see some details, and to this board who want to know what the plan is. So um, a month ago, I asked about the plans. At that point, I think it was November. We're a few days away from November. Um, we need to see some details. We need a plan, and we need to start seeing some specifics um, pretty soon. So I'm, I'm disappointed that we, we're not learning about this tonight because our, our public deserves to know what's, what's happening and what's going on. And like I said, we need to restore confidence that our focus is on a safe return. And the lack of information does not do that. So Ms. Hen, we will make public, once we share with the board, um, we'll make public our safety plan um, that uh, Dr. Zarchin Deb Somerville and team, which speaks to uh, the health and safety plan in general, in terms of how we plan to monitor. Um, we will share that with the board and make that public. And then the specific plans uh, for the four public separate day schools. And, we and beyond that, we when can we expect to see the plans beyond the public day schools? That's a very small group, as you know, of our our student population. Um, the others need to know what's what's happening. They want to know when they can expect some um, in person instruction. Yes, we will work with our design team. I, I, I hear you. Uh, we will finalize that. So 
uh, we can work with our partners to make sure we can finalize the next phase of students, um, as Dr. Rogers mentioned. So uh, again, I understand exactly what you're saying, the absence of information. We will make sure we are updating our board as well as our community. And, and I would add, thank you. And I would add the community understands that the plan can be fluid. They understand that health conditions change and they, they are understanding to that. They would rather have the information with that understanding that they need to be flexible and that things can change than not receive any information. So I would encourage um, you to put out what we can put out rather than, than not put anything out, which has been the case so far. Thank you. Next is Mr. Kuhn, then Dr. Higger, then Mr. Offerman. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, it's the main event and we're finally getting to it after 10 o'clock. <laughs> Perhaps next time we'll, we'll move it up. Um, uh, but um, I, I know that there's a lot of, um, a lot of challenges that we're facing. And um, I think one of the things we need to really hammer out here, and I think uh, Ms. Pasteur started this line of questioning and I'm gonna continue for a while. I wanna go back to the day schools. And I'm, I'm concerned that th these children that are probably some of the most fragile, medically fragile students we have are the first line that we're reintroducing back into schools. Now I know that the schools are limited and access will be limited and, and what have you, and there'll be some kind of protocols, but as, as has been made very clear, <clears throat> These kids will not be able to tolerate masks on their faces. And we don't have specific rooms for every single one of them to be by themselves. So I am curious as to how Baltimore County, the Baltimore County Public Health Department, along with Baltimore County Public Schools, thinks that this is where we should start. I don't understand why we're not starting with K through two a fairly healthy population that doesn't seem to have many issues with COVID, we are attack we're going to a very difficult different population in our school system. So I would like someone to please explain that to me. I will begin, Mr. Kuhn, and thank you for that because I know that um there's all of our students are important and our students in our separate public day school certainly are particularly compelling um, in their um, needs. Um, when we think about the students that uh, virtual instruction is a match for or not a match for, we know that our students um, with the most critical needs, our students in our public day school, often have the, the least good match to a virtual context. And so um, that is part of why they are the beginning place. You know, it's a complex puzzle. Um, and so we're beginning with those that we know the in-person is most essential for, um, to try to bring them back. I'd like to offer as well that it's important to keep in mind families will still have a choice. And so as a, as a mother, if I had a student at one of these schools and I felt like it, my child, can, I cannot take that risk for my child, um, that they have the ability to keep their child uh, virtual and the school and the school system, we will continue to work with that family. If as a family, they feel like they can um, and, and their child would benefit and they as a family would like their child to have that opportunity, then they will be able to have that opportunity. Uh, we take very seriously uh, the lives of our students. We take very seriously the medical needs and the, and the learning needs of these students. Um, and so really in working to address the most complex learning needs of our students, it will really make um, resolving the, the, the puzzle pieces of other phases um, less complex because we are really addressing our students with the greatest needs first and foremost. And so that's beginning to ad address your question, Mr. Kuhn. And I appreciate you raising it because our public separate day school students um, are very compelling for all of us. 
um, and that we want them to have as much access to professionals directly as we can get, whether it's the related service providers uh, that they need or the academic teachers, um, but we also want to ensure that they are safe and that their lives are not being un recklessly put at risk. I know our teachers who spoke earlier this evening uh, shared uh, experiences over time of, of these students' uh, journeys. Um, and so please know that it is not with um, without great thought that we go in to serve the neediest students first. So I do appreciate the opportunity to speak to that. Thank you. Well, Talked about some, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna add, um, Mr. Kuhn, thank you, Dr. Bosman and Wilkermans, for those comments. Um, and certainly, we echo those comments. Certainly, Mrs. Lichter and I, um, Mrs. Lichter, going work on her eighth year um, in working with our four public separate day schools, um, and me going into my fifth year of working with them. Um, we take that responsibility very seriously um, of all of other schools that we work with, but particularly um, our four public separate day schools, and and looking at the um, the, the survey data from the parent, I, I think I saw in the chat, um, Ms. Causey was, was requesting that be shared, um, that there there is a, a, a significant number of parents who are indicating um, that they would like their child back in because as the governor and, and the state superintendent have identified a few months ago, you know, it's the students with the most need. And I think Dr. Boswell McComas, I won't add to her comments because she did it very eloquently, um, but I think the data, at least initially, is supporting. Um, we'll know more as the principals have these one-on-one -on -one conversations this week, um, but the initial data was showing that that the parents of these four schools um, were at least interested um, in, in returning. But now having the conversations with the parents, we'll have uh, some more solid data as we get towards the end of the week. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. I appreciate that. Uh, and Dr. McComas. Um, and as a parent, I, I truly support parents making decisions. Uh, so I, I will move on at this moment. But my, my next question to you, because we sit there and say those with the greatest need, I fully understand the special needs of those, those students. But kindergarten through second grade, I would, I would lump them into the same group and you would have, uh, you know, you should be planning to bring those kids back immediately. They are not learning how to read. They are, they are not going to be successful staring at a device for six plus hours a day. <clears throat> we already know that. And I know that teachers are struggling and working to do their best. And I know that we've been hamstrung up to this point, but I, I believe that it would be irresponsible for us not to make plans to immediately introduce those students back into schools. Can you please tell me why that is not happening right now? What I would share, uh, Mr. Kuhn, and thank you, we too agree that our early learners are priorities in our groupings. Um, as we said, we're starting with our most neediest students first, which is our public separate day schools. As Dr. Roberts shared, uh, what we view as phase two includes our earliest learners that you're speaking to, along with um, students receiving special education services outside the general education classroom. Um, and so if you think about those groups that Dr. Roberts spoke to, it really begins to um, lay forward um, in alignment with what you're calling for around prioritizing. So I know that Ms. Hen pressed uh, Dr. Roberts before for an answer regarding the various groups and what I heard, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Roberts, sure. was that you're preparing for the end of semester one, which is the current plan that people go back to school January 29th or whatever that, that day is, that magic day <laughs> when, when, when we'll be prepared. Is, is that accurate? That that is accurate in what I shared earlier, right? That the current plan, um, as on the website and approved by the state, um, indicates by the end of the first semester. Um, and of course, with the safety measures being in place, we won't know what the what the safety um, measures would be like and the metrics would be like at that time. But um, that would be the the indication according to the plan at this point. So, from what I've heard, 
and what I've seen and what I've seen from the Maryland Department of or the, the I'm sorry, the, the Board of Education for all of Maryland was clamoring for schools to return now. Um, I'm, I'm concerned and, and I'm wondering why we would delay K, at least K through two at this point in time, and perhaps even the younger learners that we have. But, but I'm focusing on them because they're, you know, they're the bulk of the early learners that we have that really need face-to-face -face activity. Yeah, so Mr. Coon, I, I would at this point certainly reiterate Dr. Williams' comments around it, it's not, these are trains that are moving simultaneously in many respects. It, it's not as if it, it's, okay, let's focus on this and not do anything else. It's, there's multiple plans going on, working with our stakeholders, working with our bargaining partners, um, and really all coming to the table. Um, so certainly the first, this initial focus was on our public separate day schools. That does not indicate or, or shouldn't be taken as there wasn't work or hasn't been work being done in our, on our youngest learners or other groups. Um, it's just, this is the, this is the plan for our public separate day schools. So going into the next phase, now that, that, that we're doing this again, now the work gets deeper into the next phase, but even then, so we're looking at you know, we talked about outside general education, but there's another group potentially of small group of students. So, you know, you're talking about the other students um, in the system. So that work again is also being like, so it's really phase planning and phased approach as we go through, um, not isolated planning, but it's phase planning um, with, uh, as Dr. Williams mentioned, with our bargaining partners, um, with our stakeholders. So we have a, a reopening entry committee. We have a COVID-19 task force. Um, Dr. So Roberts. it's all of that. Dr. Roberts, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're fine. Um, I appreciate your answer, um, but we are limited on time. One of the things that I'm concerned about, as you sit here and say this phased approach and um, and, and what have you, and and basically you're just pointing to the the plan that was initially brought forward to start in, in the second semester, and that's it. That's all I'm hearing from you. Is that's correct, because, right? Or am I missing the, something? Because that's the plan that's been approved. So once that plan adjusts or is changed, then that's the plan. I'm sharing with you the information that 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 has been approved up through the state level. Oh, okay. I, all right, I understand. That's Thank what you. I shared. In so, the have you shared a plan to start any earlier with younger learners? With the younger, learners. we have to the level to the extent of the public separate day schools. No. What we're sharing with you now, what was shared with the board earlier and with the community uh, stakeholder groups earlier was the plan, the detailed plan for the public separate day schools at this point. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, Ms. Causey, at this time, I am going to move to make a motion that we are provided with a plan by the next meeting that we have on November, uh, I believe it is the 14th, to bring... K through two, at least K through two in, across the entire county into schools by November 30th. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Hen. Ms. Hen. Mr. Um, Kuhn, so board members, just a reminder that we are, uh, per Robert's rules, speaking twice to motions and uh, we are um, trying to stick to the time limit we discussed. So, um, Mr. Kuhn, you may speak to your motion. Okay, so, my, my focus is to try and bring the youngest learners in Baltimore County into schools. They are not medically fragile. Uh, give parents the option to allow those, the children that they are you know, they're confident that they can go in there. We've been told that we have all the PPE we need. We've been told that the facilities are clean and that they're available. Um, and what we need to do is get in gear and start actually surveying and reaching out to all the parents out there to determine if people are willing to send their children back to school and work with the teachers, because I'm sure there are teachers that are willing to go back to school. And if there needs to be a hybrid environment and an option for folks that aren't comfortable because of medical underlying conditions that we give students those options to continue virtually if that's the case. 
I don't know if there are any questions. Um, we'll we'll take discussion, um, and what we're going to do is, Ms. Hen, if you can note the people that still have um, chosen to speak to this agenda item, and if everyone can take their hands down, and then if you want to speak to Mr. Kuhn's motion, raise your hand back up. And Mrs. Causey, I know I seconded the motion. I would like to offer an amendment when appropriate. Now is appropriate. Thank you. Um, I offer the following amendment. Um, I move that the board direct the superintendent to bring the board a recommendation for consideration and approval no later than November 10th for providing the option for all students in grades pre-K through grade two to return to some amount of regularly scheduled safe in-person instruction starting no later than December 7th, 2020. Mr. Kuhn, do you accept that? I would, I, I'm curious as to the December 7th, is that just the, because that's the Monday, one Monday later than, than I indicated November 30th. Respectfully, members of the board, I do not believe that's an appropriate amendment. I would defer to Mr. Mercedes. You are changing the motion. That is not amending the motion. I'm sorry. I was going to just actually say that to me, this sounds like two questions. This is Lily Rowe. So I okay, Ms. Rowe, I'll have Mr. Um, Mercedes chime in unless Julie wants to modify something. I, I will withdraw I was proposing wording I will withdraw my amendment and support Mr. Kuhn's original motion okay thank you so board members at this point we have a motion with a second and we will go around the dais excuse me <clears throat> I will go according to hands for people to speak to the motion now, um, you, is Ms. Han going to first put down the names of those of us who have our hands up about the original, the agenda, please? I want to make sure my hand is recognized because it's been up for a long time, please. Okay, Ms. Pestor, and you already spoke to this agenda item? One time. I have yes. tried okay. to follow okay. the rule. Yes. One question, one time. So yes. I haven't just, spoken I'm second. just clarifying because it, we've had a lot of questions and a lot of time. Yes. So I just want to make sure. Multiple. I'm I'm okay. One Ms. question. Ms. do you have the names for this agenda item? And then we can turn off hands and turn back on if you want to speak to the motion. One moment, please. Yes, I have the names, Madam Chair. Thank you. So if everyone can take their hand down or, okay. And then put it up if you want to speak to this motion. Okay. So the Call order is- This is Rod McMillian. At some time, I'd like to speak to the motion. Thank you. Thank you, I will put you in the lineup. Uh, so, starting with what the participant list is showing me, Ms. Rowe, then Dr. Hager, then Ms. Scott, then Ms. Joes, uh, and then Mr. McMillian, and then Mr. Mahamza. Thank you, so I just want to clarify that the motion is for a plan, a safety plan, which I would expect to include things like when children get on a bus, are they evaluated for symptoms before getting on the bus? If they're not evaluated for symptoms before getting on the bus, does the entire bus have to be quarantined if a child is discovered with symptoms once they're at school? If the child has symptoms and they're sent home from school, does this parent have to get the child tested for COVID-19 before the child is allowed to return to school? The parents aren't required to do this. Can the child return to school? And if not, is the school nurse going to test the child for COVID-19? Should a child ultimately get tested for COVID-19, will everyone on the bus be notified and quarantined? And will that also include teachers? Because the bus is for our special ed students often um, anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half bus ride. And that is a considerable amount of time to be sitting on a bus spreading a virus when no one's wearing a mask. 
And are the bus drivers going to wear masks? And are the bus drivers required to show up as well? Do you see this list of questions is fairly endless. And so I would like to know if by plan, this is what we're talking about. Ms. Rowe, are you asking me? Yes, I would like to know what is that what you mean by a plan? No, so uh, so I would actually ask Dr. Roberts, who has spoken extensively about the plan for the uh, for um, public special, excuse me, separate day schools, um, because I imagine is. that the plans related to those uh, the board would is be transferred. So, something. Dr. Roberts. I'm sorry, Ms. Um, so I can address that, but Ms. Rowe, did you? I just, okay, the board is the one having a motion on the floor to ask staff for a plan. So it's unclear to me precisely what the plan is that we're asking for. I'm assuming that it means all those things I just listed, but I just don't know what's in the heads of our other board members. I guess, Mr. Roberts, I wouldn't mind knowing if that's what you consider a plan to be, but I'd like to know that when we use this general term plan for safety that we all know what we're talking about. Dr. Roberts, if I could jump in. Sure, sure. I think what we're talking about are, are mitigation strategies that we do have in place, uh, contact tracing and transportation protocols and practices for students. And that is all information that we would, would have in a plan and that we've been working on. So the types of things I listed would be in the plan? Yes, yeah, so okay. simple basic mitigation strategies like use of face covering, social distancing, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, cleaning and disinfecting, contact tracing, those would all be part of mitigation practices. And then it would go on to ongoing work with the Department of Health to monitor COVID-19 trends and metrics, that would be part of the plan as well. So if, if the community numbers spike, we can address that very quickly. Okay. Ms. Rowe, does that finish your questions? It does for the motion, yes. Thank you. Um, next on the motion, I have Dr. Hager. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I will support this because it is a plan um, and not necessarily something that will go into place, given that I, I honestly believe that we probably lost our window for reopening schools, which really makes me quite sad. Um, and, you know, we keep hearing about this plan that was released in September. It was released September 16th, which is nearly six weeks ago. And yet we haven't seen any additional plans in writing about how to get our kids back, some, some of these groups back in some schools. Um, in that time and and the fact that we are told we may need to wait until the semester, which was the original plan, that's three months from now. And so I I would love to see a plan. Again, it's it's just a plan. We saw what happened in Dorchester County where they reopened and had to close again based on positivity rates, which were not caused by the school and the kids in the schools, but a, a community transmission issue, but still they relied on the science, they looked at the at the transmission rates and that is likely what we will do. And so we'll see if we actually end up reopening on you know November 30th for these youngest kids, but at least there will be something in writing. And so I appreciate the motion, and I am definitely for it. That's all I wanted. To say. Thank you. And next is Ms. Scott. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to just under make sure I understood clearly what the motion is. It uh, uh, Russ's motion is a plan for. Um, elementary school students are young um, to return to classrooms in person. So it's, it's a, asking for the administration to bring us a plan describing how we would bring back um, the younger students as opposed to opening the original plan that they presented, which was to open the four schools. Um, just wanted to make sure, do I have that correct? So this is an addition to whatever else they're planning. So my... my oh. What I said was, and yes, please restate your motion, Mr. Kuhn. Right. It will not count towards your time. I made the motion that we come up with a plan to be provided, a detailed plan to be provided to the public and to 
to the board by November 10th that will focus on bringing at least all K through two students back into the buildings for in-person learning by November 30th. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. That's basically what I do with the year again, so I can understand. Thanks for that. Wasn't there a component in that motion, Mr. Kuhn, about choice? Excuse me, Ms. Mack. I, I'm sorry. I didn't, sorry. I didn't see your hand up. Um, so I, I'm working through. So it was Ms. Scott, then Mr. McMillian, then Mr. Mahamza, and Ms. Mack. And I, I also want to clarify that I threw in <laughs> the ability for parents to choose whether or not they were going to send their children back. So there would be a hybrid option, in essence, if people needed to stay home for a reason. Ms. Hen, do you, you are the second. Do you accept Mr. Kuhn's addition of parents having a choice? That's not, a, that's not an addition. That's what I originally stated. That's what you originally said? I was just I clarifying because I, I don't think I said that to Ms. Scott when she asked for me to. I, to thank you. Yes. Me, Ms. Cosby? Yes. The, the original motion that I um, recorded was that the board would be provided with a plan by November the 10th to bring at least K through 2 across the county into schools by November the 30th. So, Mr. Kuhn, if you, uh, Mr. Mercedes, if he wants to add the at parents option. Can he just do that in the second can approve? Nope. We can stay there, and if someone wants to amend it, that's fine. I, I, I recall talking about that, so. May, okay. I, may I amend it to include it, or can Mr. Kuhn withdraw it and, re and make a new motion? Um, no, it's, a, it's on the floor. The motion is on the floor with a second and discussion, so it can be amended. It cannot be withdrawn. Then I'm, I move to amend. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get the wording right. I move that the board direct the superintendent to bring a plan no later than November 10th for providing the option for all students in grades pre-K through grade two to return to some amount of regularly scheduled safe in-person instruction starting no later than November 30th, 2020. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Um, what so part of the wording was different? Was it the sum amount? I can't. It was providing the option. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, board members, we have a motion on the floor to amend. And um, if if people um, don't have, uh, you know, a lot to say about it, we can take the vote on that. Uh, if anyone wants to speak to that, rather than have everyone drop their hands down, just um, one at a time. Mrs. Causey, I'll speak to that. Rod McMillan. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I'm curious, Russ and Julie, are do we have any accommodations or whatever with teachers? Do teachers, are they still forced to come back or approach HR? Are they going to be given an option whether to stay hybrid or come into classroom? Are we going to consider the teachers in this amendment in this motion? Thank you. So... So I would, I would suggest that the plan, since it includes the possibility of a hybrid option, those details would need to be, need to be worked out by the superintendent and the staff to determine, you know, if teachers aren't willing to come back or are unable to for some reason, then perhaps they're the ones providing um, hybrid uh, learning or virtual learning option for those that, that don't want to or can't. Uh, go in person. Outstanding. Thank you.
any other board member to uh, speak to this motion? Hearing no other discussion on the motion, all in favor of I had, uh, I had approving, well, we'll have to do a roll call vote. So again, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, I had my hand up. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I just wanted a clarification. Is this motion saying that we're voting on the reopening or is it presenting the plan? I just wanted that short clarification. This so this is a, is, go ahead, Mr. Kuhn. This is for the amendment, <laughs> but it is for a plan to be provided us to us by the 10th so we can vote by on the 10th for the 30th. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Any other discussion on the amendment? Okay, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote on the amendment? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. The motion carries. So board members, we uh, now have the motion as amended. Is there any further discussion on the motion as amended? Ms. Causey, this is Molly. Yes, Ms. Joes. I believe Mr. Burke had his hand up, but I would also like to hear from uh, Dr. Williams on this motion and how the system would facilitate this. Okay, so I will um, call on Mr. Burke and then uh, call on Dr. Williams. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. I realize it's very uncommon for a staff member to raise their hand in the middle of all that. I just wanted to make sure that you all didn't lose the opportunity to understand the processes that would need to happen, like um, surveying staff, creating the cohorts, creating the bus routes, and that the time frame from November 10th to November 30th might not be realistic. And I thought staff should at least tell you that. Thank you, Mr. Burke. And I think that um, can all be part of the plan that is presented. Um, with the understanding that there's a goal for the plan and certainly um, recommendations and information that's brought forward. Um, discussing the plan can certainly um, provide that information to the board for discussion at that I time. Just, I just appreciate the opportunity to say something. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Ms., uh, Dr. Williams, Ms. Joes asked you uh, a question. Uh, thank you, Ms. Causey, and thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, actually, Billy Burke shared some information, but based on what what I heard from the board, um, we will have a plan um, to be presented uh, by, November, by November 10th. Um, and again, we will work with our design team, our principals, our unions and stakeholders, our parents, uh, to try to bring back um, small groups of students at the designated grades of pre-K to two. Um, it will require addition, you know, we will have our, as Dr. Zarchin shared, our um, mitigation strategies, we'll make sure that's available with the detailed plan um, we have work to do, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So, board members, um, I have left to speak to this issue, Ms. Mack, and then I had questions, and then um, we'll be able to take a vote. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, my comments are going to be very brief. I was just trying to point out that my notes indicated that when Mr. Um, 
Kuhn made his motion, he did indeed say give parents the option and students the options, send a survey out to teachers and um, ensure that there is a hybrid option based on the feedback that we receive. But we've cleared that up with the amendment. I just That's all I had my hand up for. Okay, thank you. Just let me, um, if I may just add for the board's uh, benefit on a, in our current plan that is approved by MSDE and posted on our website on page six, you'll see the specific language related to our intention to provide a hybrid model as we move into the second semester. And I just also wanted to um, uh, say that in our appendices, there's also COVID mit mitigation strategies and some of the um, uh, resources that you inquired about earlier. That's a resource that's available for your reference as well. Thank you for letting me add. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Uh, so I have not spoken to the motion and I would just say that I think it is um, very appropriate. And as Dr. Hager pointed out, we may have, we have missed windows of opportunity where the health metrics were low enough that we could have had uh, students back in and I would just uh, speak to uh, Dr. Karen Salmon, the state superintendent of Maryland, uh, who said yesterday at the state board meeting that it is time to shift the discussion away from the risks of reopening to the risks of keeping them closed, because we know there are risks to our children. And I won't go into them in the interest of time, but they were discussed quite often at, at the state board and they've been discussed here um, so I support this motion. And also, I think everyone can be very comfortable with all of the work that has been talked about tonight that has been done for um, our four uh, public separate day schools, uh, which is a uh, heavy lift. Um, and so that to uh, create the plans for the other schools where students don't have those health issues, um, you know, should, uh, should come along quickly. Okay, barring any other comments, we will now have a roll call vote. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Clausey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. And I will point out that this motion does not preclude the system from bringing forward plans um, for other small groups that uh, Dr. Roberts mentioned verbally, but were not in a list um, for us currently. So there any other additional work that and any other plans please bring them to the board. Um, so going back to people who have not yet spoken to the reopening agenda item, Ms. Hen, if you can read that list. Yes, Madam Chair, um, just one moment. We have Ms. Pasteur followed by Ms. Joes on deck. Julie, please take me off the list. Okay. So I see that Dr. Hager was next. Is that? Do you see that? I have is Ms. Pasteur, Ms. Joes, Mr. Mahamza, Dr. Hager. Um, I had Ms. Rowe. I've taken her off the list at her request. Ms. Scott, Mr. Offerman, and Ms. Mack. Okay. So Ms. Pasteur has already spoken to this agenda item. So should be Ms. Joes. And because I have already spoken once. Yes. Um, so I'm seeing that. Or Dr. Hager, but I have already spoken once, Ms. Hand, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it can also be taken off too. Sure. Don't take me off the. <laughs> you can remove me, uh, Ms. Hand. Lisa Mack. You got it, Ms. Mack. Okay, so we have Ms. Joes then, please. Ms. Joes, we're not hearing you. Are, are you on mute? We 
we are not hearing anything. Miss Joe, sometimes, oh, well, star six is if you're on a mobile device. Can tech support um, assist Miss Joe's? And we will move on to the next person while they uh, try to help her rejoin the meeting. Ms. Hen, who was next? It had been Mr. Mahamza, but he asked to be taken off the list, I believe. And so the next is Dr. Hager. Dr. Hager. Thank you. Um, I um, I just, in response to Mr. Burke's comment from earlier about um, the work that needs to be done to prepare to reopen, I just want to make the comment again that the, the original plan was released six weeks ago, and I know the design team has been working really hard, so I would hope that a lot of this work to reopen the schools has already happened. Um, so I just want to state that again, that time is ticking by. And so I, I'm, I'm optimistic that our, our all, all the work the design team has been doing will pay off and then we'll be able to actually make this plan go into effect. So I have um, two questions. Uh, the first has to do with the parent survey that was disseminated. I know we didn't discuss that during the, um, during the presentation. However, I am a parent of kids in um, three different grades and I, also, you know, make surveys for a living, so I, I, I love surveys. Um, and so I was a little disappointed that it was only four questions, and two of them had to do with video quality. And so I would love to know um, how that survey was developed, what sort of input you received from stakeholders to decide what exactly to ask, given how, what an effort it is to get people to respond to a survey, um, and how you plan to utilize that data that you're collecting. So, Sager, I think we would have to, I, I would certainly need to defer to Dr. Uh, Wheatley Phillip on the design um, of the survey. And so we can um, get back to you on that question. I'm not sure if she's available to respond on the design of the survey itself. Because I think that's from hearing your question. Right. So good, good, good evening. This um, is Dr. Wheatley Phillip. Um, the Office of Research worked closely with members of the design team to really help in developing questions that would be objective, questions that would um, get to the heart of what the design team was seeking to have answered. And so the development of the question was based on a collaborative effort in working with members of the team, not only working with um, parent groups that are part of stakeholder groups, as well as um, PTA, to my understanding, but also working with members of the Office of um, School Climate, as well as Department of Special Education, to really get a good idea of what the content of the question should contain. So the development of the question on our end really was around the design of the questions, um, and we did that in consultation and working with members of the design team. So and we, we've received thousands and thousands of emails, and I have don't recall seeing many on video quality. And so that was personally quite quite surprising to me when I saw that 50% of the questions had to do with that versus, you know, something regarding reopening or or, or uh, what a preference might be, and you know the the other types of questions that seem to be maybe more pertinent to the move towards reopening um, for students. So. so, Dr. Hager, let me let me just chime in. Um, back in July, when I made the request for a virtual start of the school year, it was the board that asked me to do a first semester how virtual learning was going, and so the original plan was just to respond to what was requested, um, and so that's why there was a survey. Uh, for parent and a survey for students. The students had more questions uh, than the parent, but the, the, the response was based on what was asked earlier on. Um, but since then, we had um, given out a common email where families can respond about the reopening. And from that, we those those points, messages, emails um, were all sent to the design team and reflected on. I just wanted to give that context as to what happened earlier um, 
this school year with the request of a survey. And then there was going to be another survey in, um, in Dr. Wheatley Phillip, I want to say December, early December, to talk about second semester. So um, there was a concern, I, I recall, that Dr. Wheatley Phillips and team expressed about the number of surveys, but I just wanted to give that context as to uh, why that survey looked the way it did based on what was, what was directed earlier on in this process of the school year. Well, and you're right. I mean, um, uh, it's harder to get people to respond to two surveys than it is to get them to respond to 10 questions on one survey, you know? So that, that's part of the reason I was so surprised to see just the four, the four questions. And that seems, yeah. So um, thank you for that information. Um, I, I, and also it's difficult to sift through open-ended responses. So having someone send an email, it means you have to code it and that takes an enormous amount of manpower. So um, asking a, a good quality survey is definitely a better, a better way to go. And I just have one other question, um, and uh, it's shifting gears, and that has to go back to this concept of are teachers told they have to come back to school or take leave? Will there eventually be an option where you can come back to school in person and teach in person, continue to teach virtually, you know, or take leave if, if that is medically necessary for you? Will there be this, this third option in the future for teachers, or is it really going to be, you know, just these two options. So as we look at our plan, Dr. Hager, I, I think right now we we only have the two options, but I'm sure um, there's gonna be more conversations around that. Um, um, it, would, it would then, having a third option would lessen the number of uh, staff members in terms of coming back into a building so we just got to keep that in mind that the the subset is or the group is starting to shrink when we provide those varieties of options but uh at the present time we have the two but i'm sure as we continue to discuss um that question will come up as well thank you those are all my questions it's my turn so, Ms. Hen, is it uh, time for, well, is there anyone else? Because I haven't spoken. It's my to turn. It is, it is my turn. I thank you, Ms. Ms. Peck, thank you. Ms. Okay. Josie, re I, back. Yes, I have on the list Ms. Scott, Mr. Offerman, and then Ms. Pasture. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, can you put my name on the list? Because I have yet to speak to this uh, agenda item. Thank you. Ms. Pasture? Ms. Scott was next, Madam Chair. Ms. Scott, then Ms. Pasture. Um, I'm willing to let Ms. Pasture go. I can speak after her. Then Mr. Offerman was after Ms. Scott. Uh, Dr. Hager asked, uh, asked one of my questions, but I would like to ask if we've had any consideration in the four public on the four separate schools because of the nature of the students there that that we would we might consider doing any initial or and or periodic COVID testing if we if we could do it and get some kind of short short-term response thank you that's all i ask so mr offerman at this time there there isn't anything in this specific plan around um short term or, or any other term uh, for COVID testing. Thank you. You're welcome. Next we have Ms. Pester. Thank you, Ms. Han. My um, uh, question is to Dr. Williams. Um, Dr. Williams, I my intent early and it still is sort of was to ask you um, to piggyback on Dr. Roberts' comments in terms of other groups, Mr. Uh, Kuhn came in with a motion, but in light of the fact that you, uh, of the positive response you gave to uh, Ms. Joe's question or asked the request to hear from you uh, and what Mr. Roberts said, clearly uh, you are looking at and your design team 
are looking at um, bringing in folks, and clearly with the uh, uh, November 10th date uh, in short order. Um, and so I'm not going to make a motion, but I'm going to trust, because I trust Dr. McComas, I trust you, I trust the team, that there's no need for it, that your professionalism, integrity, and most of all, I believe that all of you care about children. As you proceed, because the reality is, Ms. Causey said all the things that are laid out for these four schools, but what I heard, I wrote down the words that were said. There is a mental plan, but in terms of actually having spoken to parents, getting the parents to say yay or nay, and processing which teachers are coming back, and all of the things that need to be done, those are things that the words were determined or identified that need to be done in the next week. So I am hopeful that, um, as all of you, the design team takes a look at the things, the myriad of things that still need to be done, and knowing what kinds of people you are, that if you see that there is a glitch, a hole, anywhere in this, that might be a glitch or a hole for other children, but knowing that these children cannot endure and survive any holes, that if the plan is not tight for these children, because we just skipped right along with them, and they are not only our most fragile, we have to embrace them differently. I'm trusting that you will go and be ready to take on that next group, or one after that, along with what Mr. Ro uh, Mr. Kuhn um, said in his motion. I'm going to hold to that, because these children are so vulnerable. And I'm feeling in my heart so badly. Normally, I hate it when people say it's my passion, but it's because it's my truth. But this is my passion, that we are going to take care of these babies, like we take care of all of them. But these are the fruit, the fruit, the seeds, and if you will, of God's will and that we're going to protect them. And with that, I want to say something about teachers. I, I do have a problem with giving them only two options, especially if down the road there may be more conversation about more than two, because they are the first group that will come up. I, I don't think that that's fair. I think because this is the first group of teachers that come up, if anything, they ought to be given a wider berth because, one, they're stepping up first, and, two, they're stepping up to handle some very heavy lifting in dealing with these very serious um, uh, issues that they will face in those schools. And so I needed to say that. I've said it. And I know that it will be considered because I know the people with whom I'm working. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Do we have um, Ms. Joes? Are you back with us? Can you hear me? Yes, I have nothing to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Scott? Um, I think everything has uh, really been said. I just would just say that, you know, I think that um, we want, once we open, and I, I'm looking forward to the plan that we're going to get, but once we open, um, our goal is to stay open. And um, I heard someone say that, you know, loss of learning can be overcome, but loss of life cannot. So we need to be pragmatic. We need to be um, um, uh, direct. And we need to be, um, you know, really look at what we're doing, how we're opening, and our plan for opening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Mrs. Causey? Thank you. So, board members, we've had a tremendous amount of discussion, and we appreciate staff 
and their preparations and also answers at this time. I do think it has become um, clear that we need to do something a little bit differently. And, um, you know, in this pandemic, it's unprecedented and people are learning to work in many different ways. Um, and I think that we need to do um, something a little bit differently here. So I am going to, as the board chair, create an ad hoc committee on parent and staff survey to evaluate return to in-person instruction. And I am going to appoint Dr. Hager as the chair of that ad hoc committee. And um, she can select, uh, uh, you know, as many members that want to um, be involved in that. Uh, I would suggest board members that are interested in working with her, email her um, or contact her. Um, and then uh, Dr. Williams, I think it would be appropriate to have uh, staff for this ad hoc uh, from uh, Dr. Monique Wheatley Phillips draw, uh, which develops a survey, um, Dr. McComas and um, other staff that you feel will um, be able to help in this, in developing this next survey. And so I'm just happy, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Colsey, go ahead, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I just would point out that um, Dr. Erin Hager um, has a PhD. She's in epidemiology at the Maryland School of Medicine. And this is actually uh, the job that she does, uh, creating surveys um, to evaluate wellness in children and programs that can be effective. So this is right in her wheelhouse and we're grateful for her expertise. Um, so Ms. Hager, I did, or Dr. Hager, I would just like, uh, to hear that that is, uh, that you will uh, take on that role. Um, I, I'm happy to, you know, as long as Dr. Williams and his staff um, are on board with that, I, I love surveys. So if, it, if that's something that um, that it is acceptable and, and okay, then I would be happy to work with the, the staff and the other board members. Okay, thank you very much. So we will um, move forward with that. Uh, board members, so, Ms. Hen, um, that is that is all in terms of speakers, Mrs. Causey. Okay, so for oh, I did have a just a regular um, or additional comment on reopening in general, um, and and Ms. Pasteur and some others have already spoken to to this about the teachers having. Uh, that additional third choice, um, what is the plan for the students at these um, four, <laughs> it's getting late, so I'll forget the acronym, but our four special schools, um, what is the plan for teachers to teach those students that want to stay virtual? It would seem to me that it would make sense to have some teachers teaching virtually to students that want to learn virtually. Yeah, so Ms. Causey, right now the principals, and again, I'll refer back to, um, there's certainly components of this plan that, that may scale up and others that may not scale up as smoothly. Um, this is an area where the public separate day schools, because of their size, because it is small, the principals are working on a schedule where they'll be able to adjust their, and this was shared with the staff yesterday, they'll be able to build a schedule where a teacher could teach the students who choose, or the parents who choose to send their children to school, while another um, group of teachers or a teacher, or another group of teachers in another part of the building could be um, providing instruction virtually. Um, so, so as of now, again, because of that size, they have that flexibility um, and they'll be able to fine tune that as they know the number of students who are um, returning uh, by the end of the week. Okay, thank you. Um, and I had one, uh, one other comment related to this. So um, Mr. McMillian had brought up about the extracurriculars and um, Dr. McComas had said that uh, there's not... Um, a plan right now at this time and that they're taking one thing at a time. And I would just suggest that uh, while sports are important to a great many students and um, they are good as well for uh, physical health as well as social emotional, but we know that there's a lot of students 
that don't do sports. And so um, I would just really encourage um, similar plans to be put in place, things that are optional. So again, it's parents choosing what's safe for their children. We know that teachers uh, choose to to be um, have have these extra duties for these extracurriculars. So I would just really encourage that uh, we need to do as much as we possibly can for our students, especially as this time extends. Thank you, Ms. Causey. I do I do hear that, and um, we will work in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, board members, um, Julie, I'll, I'll take over now since I'm done speaking, if that's okay with you. <laughs> yes, Madam Chair. Okay, and are there any other um, comments or questions on the reopening of schools? Okay, hearing none, we will, um, we have the choice board members to move board committee updates and board member comments to the next meeting. I move to move those to the next meeting. Ms. Hen. Is second. There a second? Thank you. Is there any discussion on moving those agenda items? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Um, Ms. Kazi, I just, this is Aaron Hager. I just want to point out that we moved them last meeting as well. So just. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> um, excuse me. Excuse me. Just um, meet. let's keep our comments appropriate, please. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Hager. Could you say that again? Um, I just wanted to point out that we we moved these last time as well, and and I know that our you know individual comments. Um, I, I don't know how how much people are you know staying on the edge of their seats to hear what each of us have to say, but at least the committee updates. You know, have, have, it's been a while. And I know it's late, so I'm not saying I object. I'm just pointing that out. Okay, and um, and actually, what I would like to do—that's um, a good point, uh, Ms. Gover. If if the board moves it forward to the next meeting, um, I would like the um, board docs updated to have the specific detail in the agenda item for each committee, and the specific link for the. Uh, most recent meeting for that committee, as well as the agenda. Well, actually, we don't have the agenda set for the next meeting. So just the detail and the um, actual link to the previous committee meeting. Okay, any other discussion related to this motion on the floor? May I have a roll call vote, please? I'm sorry, could you repeat what items you're moving, what letter? Um, item M, board committee updates. And <clears throat> item N, board member comments. Thank you. Dr. Hager. Sorry, are we also moving the discussion about Julie's budget committee? That would be part of the item. Yes. I'm going to make an amendment that we do not move. I do, oh. I do not accept that. Oh, oh, oh. Kathleen. I was going to make a motion to consider your budget committee. We've discussed it previously. I would not accept that amendment. Okay. Withdrawn. Okay. If there's no other discussion, Ms. Gover, if you can take the vote. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Kester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries, and so I ask Ms. Gover to update the board committee update agenda item and the uh, 
Next item is item O, information attached to board docs is the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council. Yes, of September 28th, 2020. And item um, P is agenda setting, where we go, for this we do, um, whoever wants to submit an item to be considered for upcoming agendas, we'll go around and you can just state what you want. So if board members can opt in if they have an agenda item. I see Mr. Offerman. Uh, this is not a uh, this is not a new item, but I would like any discussion on any of the reopening plans to be further up in the agenda than they were tonight. I agree. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hen. I agree with Mr. Offerman's um, suggestion to move that the reopening discussion be the first item on the agenda or the earliest that it can possibly be um, for next time and that it include the plan that we moved tonight for the return of pre-k through two okay and mr kuhn i would like to add an item to talk further about uh, teacher qualifications and understanding the science of reading. Ms. Mack? Um, one of our stakeholders tonight, Ms. Miller-Breeze, um, requested that the board ask for information about um, our gifted and talented students and our latest test results. And um, I'll give you more information when I go back and read my notes about what specifically it is that she asked for, but an update on where our gifted and talented students are. Thank you. Any other board members? Ms. Cosby, I have one, Rod McMillian. Mr. McMillian. I'd like to have an update on the hybrid Board of Education meetings. Yes. Any other board members? Dr. Hager? Um, I just, uh, back to the public comments, um, Ms. Mack made me re recall that Ms. Bergman did mention having um, someone from our ESOL uh, population in the stakeholder um, segment. I thought that was a really great idea. So I don't know if that's, if we're able to do that for the next meeting, but um, I think it should be a, a priority. Okay. Um, other board members? I would like as part of the reopening agenda item at the next meeting to include um, a report on the attendance for elementary schools and um, as well as the attendance uh, for, for the secondary schools, just what the metrics are to date, but also to uh, clarify the um, alignment with the state superintendent's guidance on uh, instruction time. Okay, that item is over. Item Q, last item, announcements. The next board meeting is Tuesday, November 10th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. And everyone take care and stay safe. This meeting is adjourned.